You hear AI all over back home. You hear it from the big people, the Texas Medical Center, the largest medical center in the country, the future of AI and medicine. It's all pervasive throughout our economy. I find the best ideas typically, and I know I'll get in trouble for this, don't come from Washington, D.C. They come from the nurses and the doctors out there in Seattle, Washington. People that are on their feet in the front lines and on the deck plate taking care of patients day by day. I want to hear what their ideas are and then provide them the platform to research those ideas with artificial intelligence. I get this so many different times where people have three or four screens open and they're trying to make sense out of some amount of data, throw it into an Excel spreadsheet. And then I ask them, what, what are you? Well, I'm an economist, not a spreadsheet expert, right? But we've turned these people because IT is so hard and not instead of enabling them, it's actually hurting them. So I'm very excited that AI, RPA, some of these newer technologies can actually help us. I think the most important thing to consider with data is I am using this data and like ingesting it or putting it out downstream. Who is using that data and I'm, am I making it easy for them to use that data is really like the biggest driver that I can think of. We all build technology and there's always a shiny thing coming up. There's AI, there's machine learning, now there's robotic process automation. Americans are going to be able to get their health records from their providers on an app, on their smartphone for free. One thing about it is that, as opposed to some other initiatives, we are not going to be solving this problem technologically in-house. We are going to be setting standards, but we're relying on the private sector to develop those apps and to develop the ways of coordinating to get the data uh, that, that are going to bring them to the department. Good morning, my name is Michael Hoffman and I'm the president of Government CIO Media and Research. Government CIO Media and Research is the online destination for thought leadership and research focused on the transformation of government IT. Our experienced team collects the best practices and research regarding the advancing technology and management landscape. I wanna welcome everyone who has tuned in this morning to our virtual event, Artificial Intelligence, New Horizons in Medicine. We have an excellent lineup of speakers, and we're looking forward to hearing how government agencies are harnessing the power and potential of artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's obviously a unique and historic moment in our country's history, so we wanted to also address how these technologies are impacting healthcare and COVID-19. We invited some of the top government and industry executives to discuss AI and machine learning in healthcare. The topics we will tackle today include advanced data analytics, accelerating medical research, data sharing, and defense health analytics. And we'll close with the Chief Data, Data Officer Spotlight. Before we kick off with our program, I'd like to thank today's sponsors, Axiom, NVIDIA, NetApp, Red Hat, and DataRobot for underwriting this event and making these important conversations possible today. Without our sponsors, we wouldn't be able to bring our audience valuable content like this morning's virtual event. I want to remind audience members that you can submit questions for our speakers in the comment box you see below the video player on our screen, and we will choose some to ask during the conversation this morning. I also want to encourage everyone to participate in the conversation on social media. So without further ado, we'll start with a panel discussion focused on advanced data analytics. It will be moderated by Jason Chong, Government CIO's Director of Data Strategy and Analytics, and I'll allow him to introduce our esteemed panelists. So with that, I'd like to welcome our first panel to the virtual stage. I'll hand it off to you, Jason. Thank you very much, Michael. Hello, and welcome to the first session of Government CIO's virtual event on AI, New Horizons in Medicine. My name is Jason Chong. I am the Director of Data Strategy and Analytics, Government CIO, and will be the moderator. In this session, we have invited three fantastic speakers to discuss about advanced data analytics and AI in the federal and commercial space. Our, fir our first speaker is Neil Chaudhry. Neil, if you could please greet the audience so that they can see you. Hi. Okay. Thanks for having me. Yes. Uh, Neil leads AI initiatives at GSA Center of Excellence. He has 20 years of experience in technology delivery, operations, and program management in defense, intelligence, and national security sectors. At the AI Center of Excellence, Neil advises federal agencies on establishing mature data governance and management practices developing innovative approaches for leveraging data as a strategic asset and laying the foundation for advancing data discovery, access, and use through AI and machine learning. Our second speaker um, is Craig Wingate. 
Craig, if you could please greet the audience so that they can see you. Hi. Fantastic. Uh, he's the Senior Director of Analytics at Axiom. He has been developing offline and online marketing solutions for more than 20 years, utilizing a variety of statistical and machine learning techniques across multiple industries, including healthcare, financial services, travel, and entertainment, retail, and consumer packaged goods, all with a very strong focus on maintaining privacy constraints. Before joining Axiom, Craig was an adjunct professor in statistics at St. John Fisher College in Rochester, New York, and was the co-founder of Quinetix, which was acquired by Axiom in 2008. Okay. Our third speaker is Dr. Gil Altrovitz. Uh, he is the director of the National Artificial Intelligence Institute at the VA. He is a member of the Precision Medicine Task Force under the White House's Office of the National Coordinator and is also one of the core writers of the White House Office of Science, Technology, and Policy's National AI R&D Strategic Plan. He is a professor at Harvard Medical School and the Computational Health Informatics Program at Boston Children's Hospital. His work on integrative methods for big data in the biomedical informatics space has been cited by more than 50 peer-reviewed publications and books. We are having some technical difficulties. Um, he will be joining us shortly. So for this, for the, to start this off, um, everyone, for the longest time, data analytics and AI have been touted as the next frontier for innovation that will revolutionize the 21st century. Data consumption for the average consumer has really, really increased due to extended usage of platforms such as cell phones, availability of streaming content or whatnot. Naturally, this led to the next phase, which is to understand and utilize that data. And it isn't surprising that there's this rapid adoption of AI and analytics today. Uh, however, to me, it is still surprising the pace at which AI and analytics is being adopted in government. It, it really is unprecedented. So why is it so different for AI and analytics? And what do you think is the driving force for this adoption? I uh, would love to start with you, Neil, and, and your thoughts. So, um, you know, I've been in this space for a good 20 years, as you mentioned, right? I've been in from the days when we used to have our dot matrix printers printing the two foot wide reports, you know, and turning them out. And then you look over there and you're uh, doing some more work uh, to where we are now, where if I don't see a chloropleth or a heat map, you know, I, I, I get frustrated, right? Because I'm not getting the information I need that I'm so accustomed to getting uh, absorbing. Uh, okay. So and uh, yeah, so that's where, you know, when we see the art of the possible in the commercial sector and those ready-made tools where you don't have to be a programmer, you just have to be a good business lead to understand how to use the tools to get the answer you need. Uh, it yeah. makes life very simple. So, you know, that's where adoption has been increasing because we see these tools that are easy to use by anybody. Thank you. And I think Gil's back on. Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much, Neil. Craig, would you like to continue and share your thoughts? Um, sure. I agree with, with, with that 100%. And also, I think that um, the obviously the amount of data that's captured uh, in, you know, in today's digital world is stuff that you never used to have. And so tons more data, um, storage uh, capability, Again, increasing hugely, um, processing power, uh, same thing. And then you've got uh, techniques and open source really uh, unlocked that world. And so all these things <laughs> converge. And, and just as Neil said, you've got, you know, just an acceleration of people using. And now it's bridging to uh, more the, you know, citizen data scientist, I think is the <laughs> one of the terms. And so lots more folks um, involved for sure. So just very exciting time to be in, in this world. That is fantastic. So Gil, uh, why do you feel that it's different for AI and analytics? And, and why do you believe that government is adopting this at such an unprecedented rate? What do you believe is the driving force for this adoption? Right. So I think when, when you think about AI, there's a few features that really uh, make it uh, unique. Um, one of the things when we looked in the past about uh, doing analyses was that at first you could put it on, down all the numbers, all the information on a piece of paper, right? And then when you had a spreadsheet, you could see all the numbers and all the information right in front of you, right? Uh, but what we see in AI is that there's just so much information, so, so many different types of information from so many different 
locations that you actually can't see it and, and kind of feel it right in front of you. I think that's what makes AI in some ways also, um, you know, hard to understand and, and explain because you, it's not tangible because there's so much information at such a fast rate that you can't actually have it right in front of you. Um, and why it's really important right now, and I think why a number of agencies are really looking at it is because that's the world that we're living in today. The world we're living in today is information that is coming at us so quickly and at such large volumes that we can't actually sit down and take either a paper or a pencil or a look at it in a spreadsheet. Um, we essentially need the assistance of uh, computers and, and so forth to give us that information. It doesn't mean that they're deciding, uh, making decisions, but they can help and aid and give us supplementary information so we can make the best decisions that we can. Fantastic. And that leads on to my next question, Gil, and I think, you know, when there's this challenge of trying to uh, synthesize insights from the data from this large pool that is very difficult to understand, to socialize, and to really drive towards the right priorities, then, then how are you setting the priorities for AI and analytics initiatives in your organization? I'm sure there's a lot of competing priorities out there. Everyone thinks that their priority is the most important. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on what your priorities are for your organization. Certainly. Um, so uh, when we think about the priorities, we think about what is our mission and, and who we are here to serve. And uh, for us at the, the VA, it's, it's the veterans. So what we want to do is, and what we have been doing is getting um, and engaging veterans through uh, setting up a veteran engagement board through um, other activities, working across different offices that have already been engaging veterans to understand what are their priorities, what are, are their concerns around AI, what are their needs, and what emphases, you know, types of emphasis they would like to do. At the same time, we're also looking at what are uh, cross-cutting areas that can benefit a number of different um, priorities, whatever they end up being. And we've identified a number of those. Uh, some of the ones that uh, at the Institute we're looking at are deep learning, explainable AI, trustworthy AI, multi-scale AI, and privacy preserving AI. These are priority areas that uh, regardless of what, uh, or these are kind of general supporting foundational layers that will help support the priority areas that, the, uh, that we're uh, seeking and working with the veterans to obtain. Oh, fantastic. That's, that's great. Craig, what are your thoughts on the private sector? I'm sure that the priorities are pretty, very different at Axiom, and we'd love to hear if, uh, and let the audience know um, the range of differences that you can see in priorities across uh, different sectors and between commercial and also federal. Sure, sure. Definitely uh, the demand and need accelerating, and uh, Gil mentioned uh, uh, explainable AI. That's probably our number one focus. Uh, We've used AI in differing degrees for a number of years, and um, you know, both in prediction models and such, uh, and advanced measurement techniques where you have to unwind bias, and such, and also you know, te some text analytics as well mixed in there in segmentations. But the you know, from what it used to be, where you know, even a logistic regression model, you'd have a few you know, driving variables and you could show the the folks that um you know our clients how to best how to best use that and um, or how that's working and they'd understand it they could see the drivers but as as Gil mentioned uh, now you forget about it um there's you know 10 to 20 times more variables that are in models and there needs to be techniques, visualization techniques, and that's what we're accelerating really um, is explaining and showing what what the drivers are. Because if we can't convince the clients, um, you know, internal or external, uh, that this is something that that's going to work, it's not just a magic black box. Um, then, then they're all, uh, you know, then they'll they'll take it on and use it. Um, if they we don't convince them, they they won't use it. So. Continuous learning is another focus, and um, and real time applications. We're taking that up in terms of um, our work at Axiom. Fantastic, Neil. Uh, at the GSA, are, are are your priorities different? I'm sure it, it's quite different from both Craig and Gil's priorities. So you, you know, uh, I'm in a very interesting organization. 
uh, it's the technology transformation services. So not just for GSA, but whole of government. And within there, I'm in the Artificial Intelligence Center of Excellence, one of the leads over there. And what we do is we go out and we actually help our federal partners you know, at the CIO level build strategies and implement strategies to move to the next generation, right? So it's working with our industry partners, working with, uh, you know, our uh, government partners and also working with our FFRDCs and our universities to create these holistic packages and really trying to move from the past, which was relational databases, right, to non-relational databases, moving from RDBMS to, you know, uh, graph databases where the things you can do are just so interesting, right? Being able to add geospatial and temporal data to your existing structured data to find insights that you never knew existed, being able to actually not even worry about the data, just do uh, apply artificial intelligence on the metadata to get better mm -hmm. solutions, right? That's the future and that's what we're really helping our federal agencies transform to. Thank you. Oh, so on another note, just to continue on that conversation, Neil, um, you know, if you're at the forefront of it and trying to drive strategy and a change management, so to speak, and also a mindset shift of those people that you're trying to help, those agencies that you're trying to help, then I, I could imagine you're faced with a lot of challenges and barriers. Could you please describe some of these challenges and barriers to, to, and then how you're addressing them? You, you know, um, I, you know, if you've been uh, in this business for a while, what you realize it's always a people process and technology issue. You know, the technology in my mind is the easiest problem to solve, right? So you have to start with the people. And when I talk about AI, I describe AI to people as augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence. Right, because the purpose of AI is to augment your workforce, not replace your workforce. So that's the first hurdle that we go over. We say, imagine, you know, if you had five virtual assistants, the amount of work you could be able to do, high level work, you know, as opposed to minutia. Imagine if you had four to five digital assistants imagine what your work would be like. And that's the people problem, right? But then that's also education. That's uh, getting people comfortable with new technology, getting comfortable with delegation to a machine, right? And then once you work the people issue out, because this is AI in government is not about replacing people. It's about augmenting people to improve delivery of services. Then you start talking processes and you say, what processes need to change and, you know, we start talking about bias and ethics and all those. You don't want to amplify small problems by, you know, applying machines at scale. What you want to do is make sure that your models as designed are not, uh, you know, are actually fixing problems, not creating new problems. And then you work on the technology stack, which is a path to production where you say, if your technology had a lifespan of 10 years, how do we slowly sunset your technology while putting new technology in place? Because you can't rip everything out day one and put a whole new system. So those are the kind of general things, but it always goes back to people, process, and technology with the core message being AI and data analytics is about augmenting your workforce, not replacing your workforce. Thank you. Oh, fantastic insights, Neil. Thank you very much. Gil, could you please care to share your thoughts on the challenges that you are facing and barriers to achieving your goals in the VA right. and so, in your organization? Right. So uh, I think there are a number of uh, challenges in AI that really apply across organizations. So um, and we're you know seeing a number of those as well. Um, and so when you have a new area like uh, artificial intelligence, there's uh, a, a lack of um, there's sort of a, a lack of uh, of knowledge space across the organization and across organizations really in terms of how to develop uh, and, and develop that um, that workforce, right? And so there, you have to start thinking about creative and new ways to uh, do that. How do you 
uh, develop uh, talent, for example, uh, by promoting within or uh, working uh, with outside experts, uh, building teams across different agencies. There's a number of these aspects that uh, we're looking at uh, and in, in, in working across and interacting with other agencies, we're, we're seeing that um, some of the same, uh, by working together, we can really um, make a, a big difference and, and uh, attack some of these uh, challenges together. No, oh, it's fantastic. Craig, uh, what, what, can you share your thoughts on the commercial sector and the challenges that you're facing and also uh, how you're addressing those challenges? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, one of our probably bigger challenges in this, in this, uh, yeah, in the, from this angle is is uh, context of the data, and when you're putting together so many pieces and from so many different levels that they they were organized. So it's you know if it's financial, it's you know you've got account, you've got the you know, owner of the account, and that can go both ways. You know, two accounts can be owned by one person. Uh, two individuals can own one account, and then you go up to the household, then you go up to the, the branch, and you've just got multiple levels of data. So now we're applying some you know, more automated techniques to you know, process and ingest and um, you know, aggregate that. It really requires some thought on how you're going to do that. Um, and the, the other piece that, that's changed really for us is we used to be, it used to be much more that we would deliver um, a solution in whole. So we would deliver, um, it, it could be scores for, for models, it could be, um, you know, reports, analytics, insights, you know, there'd be, there's a deck and so on, but it was all fixed, what we would deliver. Now we're delivering more data sets, aggregated and organized um, data to clients so that they, their business analysts can use that and, and um, you know, get, spend way more time than we would, and they're experts in their own, you know, world, and so they can explore. And so now, and I, I learned to live with that, that other people would be <laughs> doing the analytics, um, but it, it's, it's just, it's got to be very st structured and controlled how, you know, what you convey, that you convey enough um, you know, enough of the pieces for them to understand that context and get the most out of whatever they're looking at. So context is my, well, <laughs> yep, that's the one we're, we're overcoming. Oh, wow. That's, that's, that, that's, that's great insights, Craig. Uh, given that, if you think of it, to extend that question, COVID-19 has really changed the lives of, of every business out there, people and the priorities have all been impacted. And I would think that that would be no different for AI and analytics related initiatives. Um, has the focus areas changed in your organization since the COVID-19 outbreak? Uh, as you know, in the commercial sector, uh, in general, when I speak across businesses, um, they're trying to mitigate workforce interruptions and such. Uh, lots of things have changed. What has changed within your organization? How are you approaching things differently post COVID? Yeah, def definitely a focus on um, our, our team and each other and, you know, supporting each other through, you know, th this is, is a, a, the culture is a part of it for sure. And, and um, you know, you've got kids going back to school. A lot of our my colleagues uh, have kids in that spot and it's so uncertain for them. Uh, you know, our kids are <laughs> grown a little older, but, um, but it's, it's just, that's, that's an important part of the culture, and, and we're learning more a little bit about each other, even though we're more distant. Um, the the other pieces in terms of the businesses, they're very much uh, they're they're you know a lot of experience that has been learned over the years has been disrupted, and so now you know forget analytics and modeling, but just people's experience with how to deal with their customers and you know, manage customer relations. Consumer behavior has been impacted in a, a unique and unprecedented way. And so some industries are, you know, we work with a few airlines and uh, they're um, in, a, in a tough spot and some other industries uh, are doing, doing fine, doing great. And so because of the nature of this, it's again, we just checked a little before, but um, it's, it's sort of like a, a hurricane where 
you have an event that there's people act a little bit before as it's approaching and they hear news about that during their behavior changes as well and then after. And so the challenge right now is that you have a ton of these you know, hurricanes all over that are at different degrees of strength and different people are reacting to the same event in different ways. And so you have um, really, you know, a, a geotemporal is sort of the time, uh, the name for it, but it's just, you've got a time component and you've got a geo component. And so organizing and restructuring data to look at that and, and attempt to account for that in, in the past as we move and look at data, because analytics, everything is about using today and yesterday to predict tomorrow. And so we have to have that set of experiences people are going through, we have to have that organized. And so um, it impacts measurement, targeting, you know, all the stuff that you know, our clients are focused on with us. So um, we think we've got a pretty good framework for it. So, uh, um, but it, it's tough, who knows? I mean, it, you know, next, next month, uh, a couple months from now an election, uh, it's, very much unprecedented terms. So quicker, quicker turnaround on analytics is also something that is very important right now and being flexible and quick to react for our clients, very important. Of course, thank you very much for sharing your insights on the commercial sector. Neil, could you please share uh, how COVID has impacted your initiatives, your focus areas in your organization in relation to analytics and AI? So uh, yes, uh, one of the things that I'd like to uh, say is I'm very fortunate to work for, you know, an organization, not just my organization, but the federal uh, workforce at large and the leadership that they have put uh, safety of people first, right? We, all of us took immediate steps, our leadership, to ensure that the federal workforce was safe. But that also means our traditional ways of how we used to do work have changed dramatically. And it's shown us uh, the resiliency of the federal workforce. So, for instance, in our case, we, you know, uh, you can see examples of DOD moving to a CVR platform immediately, allowing 800,000 people within less than 30 days to all communicate using collaboration suites, secure collaboration suites. Mm -hmm. Same thing with us, you know, at uh, the AI Centers of Excellence and TTS, we're already using, you know, commercial tools like, you know, collaboration tools. So we were able to immediately jump to, uh, you know, um, virtual collaboration. But we have noticed a really increased uptake in federal agency cooperation, you know, where uh, data sharing agreements, everybody recognizes the urgency that, COVID-19 is a whole of government problem. It's not just one agency problem. And everybody is really collaborating. Things that used to take a lot longer to do data sharing agreements and stuff are getting done a lot faster now, right? And meetings are, because they're shorter as opposed to an hour long meeting, a shorter meeting. And because you don't are not limited by the number of people you can fit in that conference room, you know, meetings are getting more productive right, where information is getting shared more readily. So we're seeing a lot of change in government where uh, collaboration is increasing, access to data is increasing, where everybody's realizing that many problems are whole of government problems, not an agency specific problem. And the types of tools we use, whether it's containers or uh, you know other such tools to share our models and share our information, that's the future and everybody's recognizing that. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for sharing your insights, Neil. Gil, uh, we'd love to hear how COVID has impacted you and your organization in your focus areas. Yes, um, so I, I think I first echo a number of things that Neil said. I think that uh, this is really a transformational kind of moment in, in, in a way, and uh, it has really changed the way that a number of different, um, the different people kind of work together. Uh, it's bringing together a number of the different uh, offices around a common kind of a kind a common cause, and I think that some of the things that we've seen with COVID are going to translate into the future. So I'll give you an example. It, it, it's actually uh, work that we're doing with uh, the Washington uh, D.C. VA 
on uh, these predictive models for uh, COVID, for admissions, mortality, and so forth. Um, we work with them to uh, develop and uh, integrate this model. Uh, and as part of that work, it involved work across different offices and, and things got done uh, very quickly, right? Because there's a sense of urgency as, as Anil and some other speakers have mentioned. And, and so we now know in a sense what is possible. We know that it is possible to do these things in this uh, quick way, um, and that is leading to new processes and new ways of thinking that um, I'm hopeful we can translate into the future to other areas uh, as well uh, beyond uh, COVID uh, as we uh, move forward in AI and applying that to other areas that really are going to help the veterans uh, in a number of different urgent uh, priority areas as well. All right. To expand on that question as, as my final question, has the future, you know, given the uncertainty of the times, what, what do you believe is that future state of AI? How do you feel that this AI landscape will change in light of all COVID and the uncertainty in the environment? Um, so I think when we think about what are some of the changes, uh, some of the changes have been happening already, and I think it's accelerating it, right? So uh, individuals being able to uh, work remotely across the country, we've already been doing that. Uh, and there are a number of different people from the Institute and others who are different offices working across the country. Uh, but now uh, there's been acceleration in, in terms of the, the power of the tools to allow those collaborations to happen even more efficiently. So I think we'll be seeing that. We'll, seeing, we'll be seeing an AI uh, collaborations between caregivers, physicians, patients, and the AI system. So it won't just be uh, thinking about it's like there's an AI system, there's the patient, there's the caregiver. It'll be an integrated process and workflow. And um, and I think some of the things actually around COVID, which will make us more attentive and more uh, ready to accept and work with technologies uh, like AI, um, because we're going to be more used to working with technologies where there are virtual agents, there are uh, avatars and so forth uh, that uh, underneath it, the AI can uh, really help play a role. And then, of course, the key is that I think a lot of these technologies are really going to be enabling providers rather than actually deciding for them. So um, that's going to be a key for acceptance as well, to be able to speak the language of, of the providers, of the, the different users, uh, and to help them uh, in making different uh, decisions um, rather than uh, necessarily uh, deciding for them. I think that'll uh, really uh, help moving forward. And, and that's what we're starting to see with some of the COVID things as well, right? Like we were not, we did, we have limited information sometimes about COVID. Mm -hmm. And so people are more uh, willing to accept and, and learn about new information. And I think some of that will carry over uh, into the future and being able and more willing to accept different pieces of information from sources that maybe traditionally we haven't used uh, in making uh, decisions. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for your insights. Neil, I think that's what Gil just mentioned is very similar to the point that you made earlier on augmented AI. Uh, do you feel, uh, and what, are, what, are the, what is the future state of AI for you? How do you feel that AI landscape will change for, well, you, for know, you and your organization? Uh, yeah, so AI, you know, especially, you know, putting AI out there and having open source tools where, you know, it's, it's, transferred this knowledge where everybody now can become a citizen data scientist, right? They, they can take the data and they can do wonderful things with it. And this idea about democratic access to data, that's what's going forward. You know, I, I see a lot of analysts in government now saying, why don't I have access to the data? Or they'll reach out, get that data, and they'll do wonderful things with it with pseudo-analytic tools as a precursor to using AI. And, you know, even in, you know, in my, uh, you know, in my community, we have a ton of people going to data.gov and looking at those data sets, especially with, you know, this recent pandemic, people are actually going out there looking at data sets, and then you experiment, you know, you can actually go online, you can do wonderful things, uh, you know, uh, every big platform has learning applications where you can learn. They're, they're dumping data on there. They're getting familiar with all these AI tools. So it's very exciting to see the next generation, you know, uh, taking over and not being afraid of data and not mm -hmm. being afraid of big data, just going out there. Even my kids, they can go out there. And, you know, my oldest daughter in high school is running Hadoop clusters on our desktop at home. 
And I was like, uh, oh my God, you know, so it's that sort of thing. You see that innovation across government where the analyst, the younger workforce coming up is not afraid. You know, they're like, just give me access to the data and I will show you wonderful things that you never thought possible. And that's mm -hmm. very exciting to see. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Craig, uh, when you think about the commercial sector, their government is really relying in, in, on, on the commercial side to really lead the way in, for a lot of the innovative technologies. Has the future state of AI changed for, for, for you um, in, in your views pre-COVID and now? And how do you believe that the AI landscape will change in the future? Yeah, I, I agree with everything the other speakers are saying. And it, it, it's, it's just accelerated. I mean, the, the COVID, I think, has accelerated use and need and demand. And just as Anil was saying, the, you know, so many people now are seeing visualizations and charts and thinking about um, you know, things from a more analytical perspective. And that, that helps us all. And so I, I just see greater demand for sure. The, the only thing that, that, you know, right, and right now you see the dropping of some guards around privacy where Google sharing data, um, Apple sharing some data, location data, for example. Um, that's sort that's been something that's challenging for, for us in and out within, you know, digital world and Axiom is privacy is, you know, one of our, if not our top priority, it's, 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 it's uh, tied with something else, but it, it, it's just a huge consideration at Axiom that at times can be a little, come on, can't we <laughs> use that? But we have a very thorough team that reviews um, data and reviews the pieces. And so I think this is opening up that trend a bit too. And so that people are just, as was said, uh, people are feeling more comfortable. And so data that we um, are hesitant to use, and we really, you know, some companies I think bend the rules a, a little bit, but you know, Axiom's, and I'm not just saying this, we really is very strict about how we approach digital and environments, what we can and can't use. Um, and it's, as that drops though, that just opens up more, more and more pieces because I think some of it can go away. And, um, and so hopefully we'll lead, uh, lead the government and help uh, uh, in that direction, but it, it's, it's slow because everybody, you don't want to make a mistake and give away identities and, you know, per, personal information and, um, you know, health information, especially. And so, yeah. so anyway, that's, I, I do see that the overwhelming trend is up and um, privacy though, that's the tricky part of it, balancing yeah. that piece. And that's where I'd like to piggyback off what Craig said, right? Uh, sometimes I get asked the question, why isn't the government innovating faster, right? Uh, and, you know, typically what I, uh, I explain is that, you know, there's a difference, you know, if, between, you know, if somebody gets somebody, you know, people you may know feature wrong, right? And you get an X in your feed of people you may know versus a government benefits or adjudication decision that we get wrong. So we have to be very careful. So, you know, uh, we're you know, the government is innovative. You just don't see that innovation because it's behind a proof of concept or pilot that an agency is working. Mm -hmm. But we're doing there, we're be being very deliberate because this is about public service. And uh, yeah, we have to be very careful about, uh, you know, issues of bias, issues of, you know, security, issues of privacy. And, you know, uh, yeah, so it for AI, we're taking a very deliberate approach, but we're also being very innovative behind the scenes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Craig, Gil, Neil. I, I think it was a wonderful conversation that we had. I want to thank you uh, and say that it was an honor to kick off this event with such esteemed guests. Uh, the GCIO, the audience, and I really appreciate your sharing your time, insights, and thought leadership on AI and analytics. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like we have time for additional audience questions, so we'll have to move on to the next session. Uh, this concludes the first session on advanced data analytics. We would like to transition now to the next session, which is accelerating medical research with AI. And it will be moderated by our senior vice president, Aaron Mursky. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Jason. What a great job kicking off our event today. Thank you so much to the first panel. Our second panel is focused 
on approaches to accelerating medical research using artificial intelligence. Our presenters today are tackling some of the highest priority challenges we are facing in our world. As health researchers, technologists, doctors, and leaders within their organizations, they are truly at the forefront of advancing discoveries with diseases like COVID-19. Let me first sincerely thank each of you for the important work that you're doing for our country and for your dedication and commitment. The number of COVID related projects within your space is astounding. And I know you guys are uh, you know, completely dedicated. I am impressed in getting to know you and, and the work that you're doing, so thank you. I'm Erin Mursky. I'm a leader at government CIO focused on digital health. And I am pleased to introduce our panel today. We have Dr. Patty Brennan, Dr. Mona Flores, Dr. Berus Jabastari, and Alistair Thompson. To start things off, if each of you would briefly introduce yourself and share more about the role of artificial intelligence in the health space as it relates to the work at your institute and organization. And let's start things off with Alistair. Hi, thanks, Erin. Uh, yeah, I'm Alistair Thompson. I, I have the privilege of serving as the Chief Information Officer at the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute at uh, the NIH. Uh, I also serve as the co-lead of the uh, Biodata Catalyst Program, which is our large cloud-based infrastructure for heart, lung, blood and sleep research, which I'll be talking about uh, a fair bit. Uh, AI has become a, a really important part of what we do, and it's really been enabled by uh, the, the technologies of the cloud, GPUs and other techniques, which have just made uh, machine learning techniques, deep neural networks and, and other uh, elements of, of AI feasible in ways that we've never thought before. Um, you know, for instance, we have a, a program working with the University of North Carolina within Biodata Catalyst uh, that's working on using <coughs> deep learning uh, to quantify pulmonary vascular remodeling uh, in COPD. So in CP COPD, uh, the, the vasculature in the, uh, the lung changes and shifts. Uh, interestingly, we're also seeing that in COVID-19. Uh, but that's an area where uh, entirely new research methods have been developed in order to actually understand what is happening uh, deep within the lung uh, from CT images. Uh, it's something we've never been able to do before. There's a whole variety of other things I could go into, uh, but the, I think that the key uh, thing that's happening today is that these techniques uh, are being applied uh, across the board in, in every area we're looking at it, whether it's genomics uh, or imaging or wherever else. And the, the reapplicability of, of models developed for one modality to another has been startling and it's led to some tremendous progress. That's great. Next, Dr. Brennan, who is really taking charge around the data and data discovery uh, side of things. Thanks, Erin. Good morning. I'm Patty Brennan, the director of the National Library of Medicine. In this role, I direct both our intramural and extramural research programs, and we manage enormous genomic databases, which serve as the fodder for many of the AI research activities. NLM is particularly investing in new methods to be able to create generalizable, reusable AI strategies. We're also investing in ways to de-bias data sets to make sure that they are reflective of and, and relevant to the problems they're being applied to. Finally, the National Library of Medicine plays a big role across the NIH and particularly under the COVID crisis to make sure that the data repositories that we're standing up to make sure we capture relevant data remain available, trustable, and discoverable for the scientific community. Finally, I want to remind you that the research that we do emphasizes the importance of trust, accuracy, and transparency when we're dealing with human data and human understanding. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Shabastari, I know your life right now is COVID-19. If you could introduce yourself and share a little bit more. Yeah, hi, my name is Berus Shabastari. I'm with the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging Bioengineering. I have the different hats and I'm a director of the National Technology Centers that they are big centers for dissemination and technology development. Our vision is mostly engineering the future of the health and that is to transfer through engineering, the understanding of disease and prevention, detection, and diagnosis, diagnosis and treatment. When I mention those names, AI is written all over those. As we are biomedical imaging and bioengineering, so we start with that kind of a technology, and then we've been lately added bioinformatics technologies that it covers uh, 
all the AI and related area in our application. So our director, Dr. Bruce Strangberg, puts the uh, model and computation at the center of our technology. And of course, math and AI is gonna be right at the middle and to inform the information and the technology we are developing. And our technology, as I said, it varies from engineering principle in the biology to bench to bedside and uh, point of care the technology as far as variable and impl implantable devices. Is the major one would be uh, imaging technology, when you're talking about the major imaging like MRI and CT, we are using the AI in both end, in the front end of uh, getting the images and the data and also analyzing them and making a decision. And then we also use our technology uh, that in includes AI in a therapeutics and image guided uh, delivery. So for all of that, uh, Actually, lately, I don't see any application. It does not have a word AI in it. So we basically, uh, we do support technology, but mostly we are uh, kind of a hub. Uh, our technology gets used by you know, uh, other institute like Art and Long and uh, Initial BI, uh, and as well as NCI that they use it for different things. We, we are more broad. If it's a specific, we do not do that but basically we are doing a technology development that includes AI and I will talk about some of the application later. Great and uh, Dr. Flores it's great to have a Silicon Valley commercial perspective uh, if you would introduce yourself and share a little bit more about and how NVIDIA is uh, supporting medical research and AI. Of course um, hi everybody I'm Mona Flores I'm a cardiac surgeon and the global head of medical AI at NVIDIA. Uh, three years ago, I joined NVIDIA to help in bringing AI into medicine. Uh, NVIDIA is known, uh, of course, as the world leader in AI computing technologies. And while NVIDIA's technology spans many industries, from autonomous driving to robotics to manufacturing, healthcare AI is top of mind, and especially in these times of the COVID pandemic. And you know, one, one thing to note is at NVIDIA, we do not make any direct healthcare products. However, we are, uh, as, as Baruch just said, you know, he's enabling the other institutes at the NIH. NVIDIA is really the engine underneath AI. And we are enabling uh, all of the developers, the development of an adoption of AI in healthcare with our AI specialized computing hardware, with our platforms, libraries, software development kits, so developers today can use NVIDIA's hardware and software to easily and efficiently develop AI applications, whether they are working on their laptop, on a server in the data center, or on any of the cloud providers worldwide. We really are the engine underneath all of the AI. Thank you. I know each of you mentioned AI okay. is leaking into every project, every application, every component of your work. Uh, Dr. Shabastari, if you could share a few use cases related to COVID-19 and how your institute and how NIH is applying it. The, the, <coughs> excuse me, the, what AI does, it basically mim uh, mimics human intelligence. And that's what we're trying to do. We uh, actually asking about the role of AI in COVID. I'm going to reverse that. Uh, COVID accelerated the AI. Basically, there's things happening. AI, uh, COVID has become a test bed for the AI. And right now, it's pushing the envelope. They're getting approved. FDA is approving faster. There's a lot of uh, AI applications coming out. They're one of the major ones that a couple of them I have it is basically working with the chest X-ray or the CT, getting information from the chest X-ray, combine that. When you're taking a long X-ray, it also in includes cardiac and other information. You get the information and with the other data, you combine this thing to get it to detect it. And you can do a detection in early or if you include cardiac and the bone mass and other things, uh, combining with the AI, you should be able to predict the uh, level of the thing and uh, decide that who are in trouble, what is the, uh, who needs uh, additional help. So it, it plays major role. and. It happens in all of the point of care devices. Uh, I mean, there's unbelievable interest in application in the COVID. One would be an application that is uh, basically, uh, if it works, it would be great, is uh, 
you breathe into a device and then based on breathing, the same as what the cops use to detect in the alcohol level. So you breathe to the device and it will tell you you have a COVID or not. And there are similar other application and some of them are crazy to detect them from the cough or a speech and there's other one. But I'm enjoying the challenge. And um, one thing that is important with the COVID, we just launched the consortium of that is a medical imaging and data resource center. This is in collaboration with the RSNA, with AAPM and uh, ACR, that is American College of Radiology and AAPM, that is Association of the Physicists, uh, uh, American Association of Phys Physicists in Medicine. And this has been led by University of Chicago. This is a major project. They're trying to get the data, COVID data, and clean this data and develop an AI tool to work with this data and make it available to the community in form of data that is a clean data, that is a very uh, major challenge to get the good data and then to be able to even make the tool that it would be available to everyone. Uh, it was launched last week. It would be very successful in doing many things, and, uh, but COVID is only the test bed at this time. The center will exist for other application, but it's starting for the COVID. That's very exciting news. I know uh, from talking to Alistair, there is a really important initiative to not just look at what is happening today in COVID research, but starting to prepare for the future effects of COVID on our population. Alistair, could you share a little bit more about how NHLBI is focused on the future and the data and the technologies that you are working on now? Yeah, uh, when this all started back in December, January, you know, we all thought this was a respiratory disease, uh, like the flu or whatever else. And I think the one thing that has become crystal clear in the last few months is that this is not your average respiratory disease. It is having long term, you're going to have long term effects. It attacks the heart, the kidneys, the brain. All of these are going to be, uh, you know, affected for, for a long time to come. Uh, NHLBI's mission is really in these chronic diseases that come out of uh, diseases like COVID or anything else. And so our focus is very much on uh, setting things up for the long term. Uh, using our cohort studies like the Framingham Heart Study and the Jackson Heart Study uh, and, and looking at the, the uh, participants in those studies and beginning to track them relative to uh, COVID, linking in their electronic health record data, applying AI techniques to understand what the progression of the disease is likely to be, um, looking for predictors for, for instance, uh, are, are people who have uh, cardiovascular involvement uh, from COVID today, going to be suffering from heart failure in 10 years from now. Uh, and what are the indicators for someone to do that, whether they're genomic or whether from clinical observations? Uh, and so a lot of what we're doing is, is uh, working together large amounts of data. AI loves data. Uh, and so our goal is to, to get as much data of as many modalities as we can uh, so that we can start understanding what the long-term prognosis is for patients and how we should be treating them. Um, it's made some fundamental changes in the way that NHLBI is thinking about things. It's shifted our priorities. Uh, while we still focus on, you know, the fact that heart disease kills more people in the United States than any other disease, um, and it's important, this is going to become a major area for us. And I think it's important to note that we're not doing this alone. The, I'm really glad I've got my uh, other NIH colleagues here because each each one of them has a part in the response to COVID and it's all interconnected. You know, sometimes I think people see us as these 27 individual uh, fiefdoms, but, uh, you know, the collaboration that's been going on within NIH, bringing the different talents, bringing uh, the, the NIBRB imaging and connecting it to Biodata Catalyst. Those are, those are tremendously valuable things, not just for COVID, but for healthcare in general. And we're seeing the application of AI, as I said earlier, in new ways. So for example, uh, I mentioned the vasculature uh, deep learning algorithm for COPD. We're now applying that to uh, both CT imaging and chest X-rays from COVID. 
uh, to look for, for instance, uh, early detection of pneumonia uh, in chest X-rays that, that you know a, a radiologist is not necessarily able to see. Uh, and doing that at point of care, you know, the chest X-ray comes out of the portable machine. They take a photo of it on their phone. They submit it, and it gives them a read on other some things in here that are going to be indicative that this person is going to end up in the ICU. Uh, and then tracking that through to how are we treating them in the ICU. How are we get them going to treat them when they come out of the ICU afterwards? It's uh, amazing to see the, you know, forward-leaning and the collaboration that is happening on campus, which really connects back to the Library of Medicine. Dr. Brennan, uh, if you could share more about the leadership role in data and how you look across all the in different institutes uh, in sure. that role, that would be great. It, with my colleagues, Bruce Tromberg from NIBIB and Eric Green from the Genome Institute, we are helping the Common Fund launch a new initiative called ABLE, Artificial Intelligence for Biomedical Excellence. This is a $160 million seven-year program that's designed to do a number of things to accelerate biomedical uses of artificial intelligence, create data design centers, develop what we call gold data sets, that is AI-ready data sets, driven not by original hypotheses, but rather from a discovery perspective. And finally, to develop the ethical, legal, and social guidance to make sure that the knowledge we build is reflective of and meaningful to society as a whole. Well, uh, I'm sure everyone's excited to hear about these new projects that you guys are sharing information on. Uh, so we've heard about all these, uh, the imaging and the massive amounts of data, which is a great segue into NVIDIA and high performance computing. I know you guys have been a leader in the White House Consortium for HPC. Could you share more about how that is shaping up? Yeah, definitely. Um, so NVIDIA uh, was invited to, uh, was chosen actually, uh, to provide a task force uh, for computer, of computer scientists to join this high performance computing consortium for COVID-19. Uh, the consortium is bringing together leaders from industry, from academia, from uh, government to accelerate <coughs> the research uh, into uh, COVID using the world's largest computers and compute resources. It essentially brings together a multidisciplinary team of domain scientists, computer scientists, uh, high performance computers to work on, on projects specific to COVID. So the objective is to accelerate the development of uh, effective methods to detect, contain, uh, treat uh, the coronavirus. It also supports researchers by providing access to more than 30 uh, supercomputers uh, with more than 50,000 GPUs in them. Um, so NVIDIA's task force is supporting the consortium by uh, we provide expertise in applying AI and accelerating scientific applications, whether in molecular biology and genomics and computational fluid dynamics, medical imaging. Uh, we're also tasked with optimizing the compute at scale. So if you think about it, optimizing performance is, is really creating new compute. It's as important as adding more com computing resources. So to put it in perspective, for instance, a 20% optimization on a 330 petaflop system is equal to 60 petaflops. That is equivalent to the fourth fastest supercomputer in the world. So we are contributing uh, in, in terms of, uh, of of this optimization. Also, in contributing, uh, we are contributing in packaging uh, the software that is relevant uh, to to this COVID effort uh, on our NVIDIA GPU cloud, which is a hub uh, for GPU accelerated software. And we also have research tools that we have hosted on NGC, the NVIDIA GPU cloud that are publicly available and are also optimized uh, to be used on all broad ranges of GPUs, or whether it's laptops, NVIDIA DGX systems, supercomputers. It's great to, to see that level of collaboration across the country uh, to get that computing power out to everyone. So uh, we're running mm -hmm. out of time. So I just, I really want to ask one more question. Uh, it has to do with what's coming next. So if each of you would share what projects you're most excited about, whether it's a solution, a method, a technique, what you're seeing in the marketplace. I think everyone would like to know and hear from you about, you know, what is on your mind. And we could start with Dr. Uh, Shabastari. 
Uh, there, there's too many. I'm going to say the one that I'm very excited. I'm a big fan of the data. So basically, uh, right now they're working hard to get the data. The NYU with the Facebook is an unusual collaboration that to get the data uh, faster from the MRI machine, 10 times faster. And the question is if you can use the uh, neural network to get the images and then you're using another neural network to analyze those images, why do you need the middleman? You can just basically go from data directly to the solution. And that is an area that I'm interested. The one that is going to hit the home run in a couple of years is it would be digital twin, basically to have a twin that replicates us with all the genetic information, anatomy information, and then uh, I already have a project in a virtual clinical trial, basically there's a virtual phantom that is based on the uh, different uh, uh, size of the body, different uh, shape on the but children and the adult. So you cr they created virtual human and they do uh, analysis or clinical trial on that, even uh, blood flow and other one is it one of the center that I am should have pretty soon that it would be uh, is a great way of uh, doing a clinical trial. If that has been successful, we, we're going to advance a lot. All of this is related to the AI because uh, it's been used to recreate the uh, virtual phantom, virtual machine, and visual analysis. So. I think you're going to have a fan club after this. There'll be a lot of people looking these things up. Uh, real briefly, Dr. Flores. Uh, I'm actually very excited about work we're doing with the NIH. Uh, we have already developed some models for COVID on, on TT scans. These have been published. They are used by researchers today. Uh, and we have, uh, we are building with our, our applied research team uh, and the NCI some other models coming down the line. Um, you will be hearing about them very soon. So stay tuned. Great. Alistair? Uh, I think one of the things I'm most excited about is the way that uh, AI is being rapidly applied in COVID at the bedside. Um, one of the groups we work with at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, uh, they were one amongst the first to identify the blood clotting issues related to uh, COVID using machine learning on CT images from patients they had coming in. And that drove actual change in the way that COVID patients were treated and are saving lives. Uh, and that's continuing in a whole lot of ways. And that's why we're bringing together all of that, not only our data, but data from other uh, parts of NIH uh, to, in an interoperable way. Um, somewhat serendipitously, we're sort of kind of ready to do that now. But COVID has really driven that and the ability to apply AI across all of the data, biomedical data, plus electronic health records uh, is, is huge. That's an awesome answer, bringing together technology and research and uh, the, the medical leadership. And uh, Dr. Brennan, take us home. What are you most excited about? The National Library of Medicine now has a repository of over 30 million articles almost 100,000 of which could be useful in the COVID discovery. But finding those articles quickly is a challenge. Our researchers, including Jingzhen Li, has put together an AI-driven algorithm to better search the, the literature, to bring a, use a relevance-based ranking to bring, literature, bring the COVID-related literature by location, by the kind of, whether it's a therapeutic trial or a vaccine trial, and most importantly, by the, the most recent results. We're also bringing in preprints. So the COVID literature is now informed by very quick turnaround from the literature. So we're accelerating the access to the literature just as the computational folks are accelerating the use of it and the application of the findings. That's fantastic. So I want to thank each of you. Amazing work that you're doing. Thank you so much for taking the time. Our next uh, panel is led by my friend and colleague, Alex Brown. They're going to be focused on data sharing techniques, which is a great segue for our discussion, uh, we, we got them teed up nicely. So thank you everyone. And I'm passing the virtual mic over to you, Alex. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you so much, Aaron. I do very much appreciate that. Um, and I am joined today by two very esteemed panelists. Uh, one is Ms. Karen Evans. She's the Chief Information Officer with the Department of Homeland Security. And we are also joined by Dr. Vohit Chital. Uh, program manager 
with the Defense Advanced Projects Research Agency, more affectionately known as DARPA. Uh, with that, Ms. Evans, would you give us a 30 second thumbnail on your history and your, your role with DHS? Well, I've only been at DHS since June the 1st. Um, my previous role was I was the Assistant Secretary for Energy Security, uh, Emer uh, Cybersecurity and Emergency Response, fondly called CSER. And so um, that was a brand new office that was established by the Secretary of Energy. And prior to that, I ran um, a cyber talent effort called the U.S. Cyber Challenge, which was a nonprofit. And um, my experience, I started as a GS2 and left the government under the Bush administration in the position that is now called the federal CIO. So that's it in 30 seconds. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Dr. Stone? Sure, yeah, thanks. Hi, Alex, and thanks everyone for joining today. I'm Rohit Chitale. Um, many people know me as Ro as a nickname. I am an infectious disease epidemiologist. I've been uh, at DARPA for about a year now, so not, not that long. I um, have about 20 years of background in disease surveillance, operative response, um, uh, d you know, d disease detection. If you remember the, the movie, the show House, that's on House MD on TV. My background has been that for global populations. So looking for diseases, finding them, stopping them quickly. That's sort of a big, little bit of a nutshell. So ah, happy to be here. You. Ah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hey, so look, let's uh, let's dive in. Um, AI is all the rage. It has been. Uh, data sharing has been something that's been particularly important across industry and, and particularly across government with the, with the environment we find ourselves in right now. Um, you know, this particular technology and science represents countless opportunities to innovate in, in several ways. Um, what are some of the ways that you are leveraging AI as a tool to uh, meet the mission and objectives of your organization? Ms. Evans? Well, in this particular role as the chief information officer at DHS, I'm getting my hands around all the data and the possibilities. So as you have said, there are a lot of opportunities of how we can leverage the data in order to be able to really understand, for example, more about our workforce. I'm gonna get really selfish and talk about the cybersecurity needs and the skill sets and what we have and what we don't have and partnering with our chief human capital officer. Um, she has a lot of data to be able to leverage that, but also then to be able to project out into the future. What are the future skill sets that we're going to be able to have and that we're going to need in order to manage the art of the possible? Because technology is, is so ingrained in everything that we're doing, we're going to have to be able to have the right skill sets to manage the art of the possible. Thank you. Dr. Shatale? I think you're on mute. Thank you. Take my phone. <laughs> All right, better. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so so for us, I mean, I completely agree with Karen. I can tell you a little bit about sort of, you know, DARPA. A lot of people don't really understand DARPA. So I'll just tell, tell you about 10, 15 seconds about what DARPA is. We're a DOD agency within the USD or Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. So we're sort of, you know, in one pillar and then another pillar is preparedness and readiness or response, which is related to the health of the force. So we're under the research and engineering parts. Most people know about the internet and GPS and hypersonics and aviation and even artificial intelligence. A lot of the, really a lot of the wins with artificial intelligence, including the sensors uh, in the phone have been developed through DARPA programs. So uh, a lot of the focus with DARPA is to really do transformational activities. So a lot of the things that CDC, NIH, USAID are funding are actually not things that we fund. We fund big sort of moonshot type technology. So we, we sort of look for, you know, look to the top of the Empire State Building or the moon and say, where, how can we get there and show, you know, what, where's the technology to get there? So with, there's a lot of focus on really thinking big and transformationally. So, you know, the reason I tell you that is one is to let everyone know kind of what DARPA's focus is. A lot of the incremental changes and incremental research is not what DARPA's focused on. Um, I actually inherited a program about eight months ago called PREEMPT. PREEMPT stands for Preventing Emerging Pathogenic Threats. 
and uh, it's on the website. So basically the goal of preempt is to block and prevent zoonotic disease transmission. So the, most people, most physicians, scientists are focused on looking at the human. How do we get a drug into a human? How do we get a, how do we get a prophylactic into a human? But the preempt program focuses on preventing the diseases in animals and insects. So really, really what we call DARPA hard. And so just a couple of quick, um, I'll just mention a couple of quick performers. So we have UC Davis, University of California, Davis, that is actually looking at a disease that's big in West Africa called Lassa fever virus. And so trying to prevent the spillover of Lassa fever virus from rodents into humans. So that's, you know, they do that using some really neat AI, some machine learning, boosted regression trees, for example, to understand what's the sort of remote precipitation data, what's going on in the climate uh, in the area, uh, what are the species of vectors in that area, which, which what's the burden of, of illness or infectious disease in those rodents, and what are factors that might be involved with spillover to, uh, to humans. The UC Davis is working on a scalable countermeasure basically would be a vaccine that you'd put into the rodents that would then propagate through several generations and that would then stop loss of fever virus within the rodents. I'll mention one more group right now for this, this question uh, is Montana State University and their, their sub-performers, Rocky Mountain Laboratory, UCLA, and many, many groups around the world focusing on risk factors involved in the spillover from from bats to intermediate reservoirs and to humans, right? So we all know that SARS coronavirus, coronaviruses have come from, come from bats, that's generally accepted, but how do they, you know, they go from bats directly to humans, usually they go through some intermediate reservoir. So understanding the pathways from bats to humans and then within a human, what's going on? There's a lot of really interesting, uh, you know, boosted regression trees, supervised and unsupervised learning models that are used to figure out those pathways to try, uh, to spill over. So those are just a couple of quick examples of how we're using um, AI. Gotcha. Hey, well, let me let me ask you this question. Um, and you may have touched on it in, in the previous response, but I mean, to your point, you have H1, N1, SARS, and now COVID-19 is, you know, pandemics that seem to come out of nowhere to some extent or another. And, and not to, you know, forget about Ebola. Um, is the preempt program leveraging AI? And if it's not leveraging AI, what are some of the programs that you're leveraging AI to help with some of the surveillance systems and the controls to kind of get out ahead of those? Yeah, right. So I would say that, you know, we have six performers within the uh, preempt program. I mentioned too, UC Davis and Montana State is the prime performer. We call them performers. Some agencies call them partners. Um, and then we have four others. Uh, I might mention them throughout the, throughout the session. But uh, every one of them is using some basic machine learning, whether it's a first wave, usually it's a second wave sort of machine learning techniques. Um, I would say most of them, most performers are using um, ensemble models, mainly because of the explainability of those models. We, we kind of stay a little bit away from some of the deep learning uh, neural networks simply because we're trying to understand my performers in my program are trying to understand the explainability piece of that, right? So there's explainability versus performance. And the more uh, explainable it is, usually the performance goes down. So, uh, you know, this sort of pushes us more towards ensemble models and things like boosted regression trees or Bayesian networks or, or different, you know, CART models, for example. But, um, you know, getting sort of back to your, your question, you know, disease surveillance is something I've spent a lot of time doing, whether it's syndromic surveillance or case-based surveillance or event-based surveillance. I did work on event-based surveillance at the CDC about 15 years ago. And so I think, you know, we are using AI increasingly, a lot of natural language processing, uh, language translation algorithms, for example, being used both, you know, on the unclassified side and classified. Most of this, though, these days is open source information. So, you know, everybody has access to it. But uh, the idea really, I think, here is that for disease surveillance systems and, and disease control systems, there's a lot of focus on, you know, we have these multimodal or sort of individual data streams, which are really great uh, case-based surveillance, for example. So uh, surveillance system for polio. But what about uh, what about the fusion of data, right? So the you know the fusion a few years ago was kind of a dirty word, but really the idea is can we fuse it intelligently to get at indications and warnings of early early data or early you know events? The Ebola, Ebola case, a human case in the middle of Congo, we can actually pick up those cases. We can pick up a dead cow in the middle of Saudi Arabia with these. Things. 
Mm. So there's a lot of focus on that. I think it's important just to say, you know, and I can talk more, but um, that that biology is really a different animal than, you know, than sort of abiotic systems, right? So you look at, you know, you look at the phone and you go, okay, this can recognize your face based on a lot of the features and using a neural network. It's a lot harder in biology to make sense of, of a genome because of complicated sort of what genes mean all the way to sort of the omics techniques to, to, to what actually is produced as a protein. And so anyways, I just want to say a little bit about really talking about that. that can get, we're doing a lot of work in, the, in lots of different areas there. So yeah. Gotcha. Well, great. Hey, look, thanks so much. Um, I think there is frequently the opportunity for the government and the, the private sector to work together. And I think even within the government sector, there's the opportunity to share a great deal of data. Um, you know, Ms. Evans, I, I had spoken earlier about some of the things that DHS is doing, how that information working with organizations like DARPA might be leveraged uh, using AI to actually advance uh, being ready for some of these things? Well, in listening to Ro talk, which is very exciting, gets me very excited when I talk to folks who work at DARPA, um, you're, you're really looking at, um, from a CIO's perspective, the practical applications of the inventions, and they think of, like, what if? And, and then what the government, in partnership with industry, the way that you're bringing it up, what we have the opportunity to do with our data sets is actually then take the next step and the promise when they're looking at really big things. And it looks like it's promising to, to work through some of these things, then we get the opportunity to try to implement them in, within a government enterprise. And so uh, it's taking some of the vision that DARPA has um, because you can see the excitement and everything that they're talking about and then bringing what Roe has envisioned and then those partners, we call them partners, Roe, um, with uh, the universities. Um, but being able to say, is there a practical application now to be able to do that and then what then becomes the challenges? And so what we were talking about earlier and some of the things that we're doing for contact tracing in order to be able to bring our workforce back, right? But then because of the public health issue that we have, and then you're talking and looking at all the other things that Ro was talking about with CDC and how we have to report the data, there's a lot of opportunities that you can then do that analysis from that contact tracing that we're just doing with our own, um, that we want to be able to do with our workforce when they come back so that we can then, as they're in their communities, ensure public health, right? There's public safety issues associated with that. That's the same thing that Roe was talking about when he's looking at DOD as a whole. And then what are those issues? How can we apply the data? How can we apply some of these really long range types of things that would affect our workforce? And his efforts are gonna be powered by what I, I believe you're getting to, which is a lot of the data sets that we already have within the government. Gotcha. Oh, okay, thank you very much for that. I don't know um, if um, Dr. Chile, if you had anything to add to that. If not, I think we can move right to the next one. I mean, I think okay, it's a yeah. I think she, she covered it quite well. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> here, uh, another question for you. So, with science and technologies that abound and they they offer all of these opportunities, there's generally. Uh, some challenges related to the practical application of them. And just curious to know what you can foresee in terms of some of the unexpected challenges or some of the challenges that you would see in the near future as you push forward with some of the implementation of AI technology and sciences. Well, can I take this first before, um, because we'll all get excited when Rose starts talking about the things he's doing. Um, but I do want to, I want to make a little plug here is, is that you, you actually hit on something that's important to the administration, which is the partnership talking to industry, but then what are the challenges with the technologies and the bounding? So the administration does have um, an executive order out there dealing with um, artificial intelligence and maintaining the leadership, America's leadership with artificial intelligence. And it is led out um, from the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And the idea behind that is really 
to answer some of the questions that, that you're posing, like we can see it from our, our practical and my environment, but um, what the administration's really trying to look at is, okay, we, we're leading in artificial intelligence, but what, what could potentially be some of those challenges as we work with our industry partners and what, what would be some of the unintended consequences? Like I know what they're gonna be in my environment and what I'm doing as the CIO of DHS. That's why I have a chief privacy officer and a civil liberties officer and all these other places so that we can work on those. Um, but there's a lot of promise from this data and from this technology and using um, machine learning and artificial intelligence to predict trends and those types of things. And so um, it really is gonna be like, okay, you have this data, here's how we could use it. What are gonna be the challenges of that? And so I think uh, that kind of sets a row up to talk about a lot of other things over that's happening at DOD and in DARPA. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I mean, I, I certainly echo your concerns. I, I would just, um, what I would do is I would probably just talk about some of the things that I think about uh, that my performers, partners um, like to think about. I personally like the word partner better myself, but uh, <laughs> in any case, um, it's, it's just a word. So, um, you know, I think, you know, one of the challenges that I think about are training data, you know, so training data are, are really hard to find in this field. You know, um, it's not, uh, it's not like you can scrape the internet, you know, and just find a whole bunch of data. Certainly you can do that. And we do that for disease surveillance, disease detection, but, um, you know, if you're looking at things like viral evolution, quasi-species uh, evolution, uh, how do you get that data? You know, you get that data through laboratory work or through maybe some robotics that are used in, in, in some really new technologies that we have a group, one of my performers created a new technology called a viral reactor that essentially is a ro robotic technique to pass cell culture through many passages and be able to develop mutations. So really interesting stuff, but you, you got to do that work. There's a lot of field work and a lot of bench work that's needed to produce that training data. Um, and so the other thing that's interesting is my, my performer, UC Davis, that's working on transmissible vaccines or scalable, scalable countermeasures, as we like to call them, uh, is, is, you know, they, they say, look, we have all this data in animals, but we don't have enough data of what's going on in the humans because governments maybe don't want to share that data. <clears throat> because if they're sharing that data, they're admitting they have they have an issue, right? This has come up uh, in the current outbreak as well and all over the world, uh, you know, including here at home. So I think that uh, the concern is really, you know, getting that data. Um, I think that, you know, you know animal countermeasures need uh, other data sources. I mean, think that if you think of weather forecasting, something that uh, under Obama, I recall, there was a, um, a czar for, um, for prediction and he basically put out, can we create a national weather service for disease forecasting? Many of my colleagues have worked on those areas, and one of the areas, you know, that the weather uh, weather service had not looked at, you know, 50 plus years ago, was sea surface temperature. Right? We all now recognize climate change and the El Nino La Nina situation is all based on sea surface temperatures, but that covariate was not used in in modeling this before for weather forecasting. So, um, you know, I think that those are a lot. And the, the, another one I would just mention is privacy. Privacy concerns are increasing, right, with data, with really the lack of privacy today, um, with really not really good standards on how we do privacy. Uh, so I think that, you know, understanding, for example, who's walking into my house, who's walking into the DARPA building or into the Pentagon or into the DHS headquarters, we would like to know, are they, do they have COVID? So right now we use temperature, but, you know, temperatures emitted IR is not really very good for that. And finally, I would just sort of say that one of the concerns we have, and it's outside the scope of this discussion, is certainly geopolitical concerns that probably everyone is aware of from watching the news are issues related to sort of challenges with the AI. Hey, well, thanks very much. We are, um, I'm conscious of our time. We actually have a question for the audience. I'm going to toss it out to you both. And um, Ms. Evans, if you wouldn't mind uh, tackling it first, I'd appreciate it. Uh -oh. okay. <laughs> With the prevalence and changing pace of AI, how is IT within your organization keeping up with the fast evolution of AI? So I appreciate the question. And, and I don't know that it's so much the technology that has to keep up with it when you're starting to look at it, because especially as we were talking in the pre-brief, if, if, if you have a scalable solution, so a lot of us um, and my predecessors here, so kudos to them, 
have moved forward. You know, we have network modernization. You're in the cloud. So a lot of this gets to data management. And that's what Rob was really talking about is like training data. And um, the like, you don't necessarily want to start putting out these algorithms and using certain things with machine learning on your actual live data because of all the issues that he just brought up, dealing with privacy, dealing with those things. So I think a lot of it is having an environment within an operations like ours, and you could call it secure de uh, development operations types of things, where you can have a data set that you're saying is training data and be able to test and have the machine learning, keep learning off of it to see if it's actually going to achieve what you want it to achieve in the operational environment, whether it's new mutations and viral stuff, or whether I'm trying to secure against uh, cybersecurity attacks and, and things that are coming in so that my network can be self-healing. Um, I think that piece, you don't want to test it on the full operational capabilities of what DHS has. It's being able to create the environment where you can test these algorithms and, and the effects of the AI going forward. Uh, fair enough, I appreciate that. Dr. Uh, Tatali? Yeah, I, I think that I really don't have much to add. I think she did a great job. The only thing that I'm thinking about would be, you know, our IT department is probably just like any other IT department, frankly, because the reason being is, uh, you know, we do classified, we do unclassified work. Uh, and most are the ones, the partners are the ones that are that are doing it, producing a lot of data. Uh, we, we, we encourage, you know, publications, public domain release. We encourage companies being formed. We encourage IP being created. So really, it's sort of much more on that side than I would say on the IT side. Um, we, we, we know we have a great system where we're all working. A lot of us are working from home. Obviously, for classified environments, we have to go in. Um, but I think that, you know, so the crossover, I, I don't see quite as, as, as important as maybe what I think what Karen has sort of covered it nicely. Gotcha. Oh, gotcha. Okay, I have one last question for you. Um, and I've always been fascinated by this, you know, having worked across you know, IT management consulting for the better part of 23, 24 years. Um, the talent for any new technology or science that's generally applied, um, whether it's across the federal government or anyplace else, is, is in high demand. And I'm curious to know how you guys are tackling the ability to keep pace with getting the right type of talent in when the public sector, I'm sorry, the private sector is, you know, they're really looking forward to being able to attract the top talent. Um, so maybe, you know, Dr. Tatali with that, maybe if you, you know, if you could take that on. Yeah, sure. No, that's a, it's a great question. Very, very relevant to today, to DARPA. Um, I think when you build, build a good brand, you can attract people. Um, Government salaries are not what Google pays, right? Or even the Gates Foundation where I used to work. Uh, that being said, the DARPA has a strong uh, brand and it also, we have strong links everywhere in the world. It's uh, when I was at the Gates Foundation, people would say, anybody will take the call. And I feel like that's how, how it is now. Um, so I think that, you know, but I also think that collaborations are important. So we, we don't, you know, we're not a silo. We want to work across government. We, we have a, uh, what's called an embedded entrepreneur initiative, where we actually try to say, look, we're, we're going to fund companies for early maybe development work. It's, it's maybe a lot of money for a few years, but then if you don't produce, no more funding. But the most important thing is produce something and create a company out of it, create IP out of it. You know, we have, like I mentioned, the geopolitical concerns. We have we have something going on on the other side of the world, and we, we're trying to deal with that as well. So trying to keep talent here within the U.S. was very important. So I would say, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can. We have young faculty awards. Uh, we don't really have classic internships or the, or the like, but I think that increasing these kinds of forums and a lot of the way that I've sort of, I've worked across the CDC, across parts of DOD, uh, now working, you know, maybe meeting with Karen in the future, we can, we can create these collaborations where we can engender folks from DHS coming over to DARPA and vice versa. So I see a lot of that, including booths where you were before, right? So we have people coming from private firms as well. Gotcha, gotcha. Ms. Evans? Well, I, I don't know that I could have said it any better than um, Bro on that, but and I do look forward to me uh, us collaborating more because I love working with the DARPA folks. Um, but what I think really for me and for the government as a whole, I agree about the salaries. 
but the types of programs that you get to work on here and then the funding associated with it, um, there is some limitation, maybe not at the Gates Foundation, but there is some limitations when you're out in private sector. I was out there for 10 years about what you can do and how you can move that forward, right? But when you're in the government, you can do the art of the possible if you make uh, the right business case, right? So you may not necessarily get your own personal salary, but the satisfaction and how you're affecting things into the future and being able to do things and invest on behalf of the American taxpayer for things over the horizon. So I'm going to go back into looking at some of the things with DARPA and artificial intelligence is over the horizon, just like it's new horizons here. Um, you get to take risks here within the federal government that maybe sometimes private industry companies would be a little risk averse. And that is the right role for government to invest in those R&D efforts. We have a science and technology group here that works out directly in Silicon Valley to be able to do those types of things so that we can then integrate them into government operations. So um, I think you get to take, I know people don't think the government is risk takers, but you do get to take a little bit more risk because that's really what we should be doing as a government and in order to be able to invest in those R&D efforts into the future and then take that intellectual property out to commercialize it. Okay, well, listen, thank you both very much. I really do appreciate your time today on this panel. Uh, and I am going to turn it over now to my friend and also colleague, uh, Mr. Jason Windsor. Uh, he will be speaking about the defense Health Analytics. Uh, he is the Chief Health Information Officer with GCIO. And uh, with that, we will say goodbye, and I will be touching bases with you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Alex. Uh, welcome to the next panel where we're going to be discussing, discussing Defense Health Analytics. I am Jason Windsor. Uh, Alex's partner and colleague, as he mentioned, and the Chief Health Information Officer at Government CIO. And I am joined today with uh, three of my friends uh, that I've known for quite a while. Um, we are not going to be talking about our beard care. We are going to be talking about Defense Health Analytics. So I'd like to introduce uh, Ben Cushing. Uh, ben Cushing is the Field Chief Technical Officer over Federal Health at Red Hat. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jesus Caban, who is the Chief of and Research Informatics at the National Intrepid Center of Excellence at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. And I'd like to introduce Chris Nichols, who is the Program Manager of the Enterprise Intelligence and Data Solutions Program Office in the Defense Health Management Systems Program Executive Office. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, we've known each other for quite some time. A couple of us have worked with each other for quite some time. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us to discuss some of the issues. I'd like to open it up with a question for all of you um, that kind of starts to set the stage of what we'll be discussing. And the question is, is, what are the biggest challenges for you and your team that you're facing with storing or analyzing health IT data? And of course, when we say health IT data, we're talking everything from EHRs, devices, registries. So I'd, I'd like to see what some of the biggest challenges you guys are facing with that. Chris, let's open it up with you. So I think um, I think you spot on with what you just stated, and I want to go back to that real quick, is health IT data is not just health data, right? It's not just EHR data. It's all the subsequent data that, around, that surrounds that. I look at EHR data, honestly, as one source, one data source, married in our in our current environment but you know when we talk about health data we're also we need to be focused on social determinant data uh biomedical device data over time genomic uh proteomic data uh imaging data etc because that's where you're going to really get the source and 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 capability to really drive the insights with things like ai and machine learning etc um we just went on a big path over the last six months to move everything. I own all secondary source data for, for EHR data, as well as other data within the DOD health space. And we moved all of that over the last four and a half months and went live in June uh, in AWS. So our big focus right now is, is smoothing everything out 
and then starting to integrate and how we will leverage it and putting, putting all the right processes in place so we can know where the data is. And so then we're also onboarding all of the historical in data into the MIP. So then we have one space that we're tying in the future state data with all the longitudinal historical data. Great, great. Thank you very much. Ben, can you add to that any, any, any piece? I know you work on some of the aspects, Chris, but then also in your own shop, uh, the challenges with health IT data analytics. Ben, you're on mute. I, I'd say across the healthcare industry at large, um, and, and especially in federal healthcare, uh, interoperability is still one of the, the largest challenges. Uh, disparate data sets are a major hurdle to pre and post processing. Uh, and it's just very difficult to produce insight from data that has not been cleansed and normalized uh, for standardized semantics. Uh, and second interoperability, I'd say the distribution of data across siloed infrastructure. Um, so, you know, a lack of centralized availability and the, just the sheer gravity um, that the, those large data sets represents uh, just greatly hinders insights. Uh, so, you know, overcoming those kinds of challenges are, are is really where Red Hat's putting their 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 um, uh, investments, and, and again across the uh, the larger healthcare market. Great, great, thank you very much for that. And of course, Jesus, uh, you know, with with your experience in in research and informatics, uh, working with both Ben and Chris as well, uh, what's your take on the challenges that you see facing analyzing health IT data? I said, thank you. So from my point of view, uh, we have been for nine years, my group has been uh, analyzing DOD-wide data, creating a lot of the machine learning models for about nine years now. The biggest challenge, it is the validation of the data that we're using. Why? Because um, healthcare data is not clean, right? It has a lot of um, bias in the data as well. It comes, it, it's also replicated across different systems, right? There is a, a lot of ancillary applications. There's a lot of different databases, different EHR, um, and so on. So when that data is combined, validating that all the data is combined or joined correctly, making sure that the data that you feed the models, the predictive models and the machine learning models, it is, uh, you know, it is correct, it is valid, and so on. That has been the biggest challenge. That has been the biggest factor that delays the, the development and deployment of these machine learning models. Mm -hmm. Great, and thank you very, very much for that. So, gentlemen, with, with what you just discussed and taking all that into consideration, what processes must be in place or be completed in order to prepare data? So if it's health IT data that we're talking about and analyzing, what are some of the processes that we need to have in place? Ben, do you have a thought on that to start off with? Yeah, I mean, assuming the data is accessible across boundaries and consolidated either physically or through virtualization, uh, I would say transformational services are really essential to success um, for both data in motion or data at rest. It just depends on when you actually want to do the processing. Um, I would say the adoption and enforcement of FHIR and other standards are really game changing, um, but we still have to apply those standards, right? And that's gonna be a, a slow process across the industry. Um, and it's largely gonna be done through transformational type services uh, that a number of vendors, including Red Hat, you know, it really has um, buckled down and, and done the, the hard work to put forward. Great. Hey, Seuss, um, Ben just mentioned FHIR and some of the other processes. Are you seeing the use of those technologies or any other back-end processes at, uh, in your shop? Unfortunately, no, right? The adoption, uh, and this is, I'm speaking of myself, right? So, but the adoption of data APIs across the military health system, we are behind, right? Mm -hmm. But that's why we do have uh, leaders like Chris Nichol, knowing that there is a need, and we need to put the infrastructure in place, the policies and the governance in place to be able to enable that. Because right now you're asking about, you know, some of those, what needs to be done, right? We're still at the level of, across the MHS, we just need a data catalog because we still don't know all the data that has been collected, 
right? So starting with the baseline say, tell me what every system in the hospital across the NHS, what data elements they're collecting, or if they're pulling the data from someone else and then giving me the data, tell me the data lineage, where that data element came from. We're still at that point, that is an important part to be able to then later enable those APIs that can provide data as a service. Mm -hmm. Excellent points, excellent points. Uh, so Chris, um, on that note, and, I, and it was a great transition from, from Jesus, and for those of us that have worked in government or for government, we, we understand that there's restrictions, we understand that things can't move as fast, so what do you see as some of the challenges facing defense health in order to capitalize on the new data analytics opportunities that are out there? So I think first off, I'll be the first to say, right, I abhor technology. I'll be, and I'm, I'm an informaticist, right? I'm a, health, I'm a clinician by background. And I got into this industry and out of the clinical side, not to drive technology, but to put the right technological components in place to drive better health outcomes. And I say that because everything that Jesus was talking about, the data provenance, the cleanliness of the data, it starts more from a human factor piece. And that's where we got to work backwards to get to those things, right? And so <clears throat> we're really driving a lot of things around really the eight tenets around enterprise data management in order to really focus on how do we drive better governance? How do we help drive this organization to understand um, that we need a CDO to be put in place, not for me to be the CDO, but to then drive that functional aspect of things from a requirements and partnership perspective, right? Uh, and then data quality management, data master, master data management, I mean, MDM, as well as metadata management, all of those things tie in together. And I think those are, because what we really want to do the clinicians, because you've got really multiple communities here, right? You have the clinical side and you have the research side and other, many other variant sides, right? But the clinicians, they don't need to know where the information is coming from. They need to be able to trust it. And so part of that is us getting to the point that we present them the information in a useful manner and we manage the back end capabilities the right way um, to drive those things to, to, to to reality. I think that's that's the focus piece. And then us, like I said, moving to AWS and, and starting to aggregate all of that. Jesus talked about a second ago about uh, more of a data, automating a data dictionary. And that's where we're in the process as well. We were doing that in parallel with our AWS move. And now we're up and running on that work effort and actually just, just executed that vehicle. Because the intention there is, is, so we know where the data is and not just the data within the MIP, the MHS information platform, but all of those other varying sources. So we know to where to go get it, right? And that will help drive us towards really being a federal health data hub. And I think you made a great point in differentiating between data analytics opportunities and just new technologies. Right. So I appreciate that because that is something that uh, we've always had to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. And now as a sole taxpayer, I do still appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any other aspects of that and challenges you see in capitalizing on new data analytics opportunities? I, I think it's it's the partnerships that we, we define. And I think we need to work towards... Um, when you say new technologies, it's it's really what are we trying to, to to get to, right? I mean, when you start talking supervised unsupervised learning, and you start talking in the machine learning and AI, and I really call AI. I don't really call it artificial intelligence. I call it augmented intelligence, and I do that because it from a for the functional, it should be augmenting the clinician. It should be augmenting the work that they're doing. It's not replacing them, right? Uh, there's a company out of Seattle uh, that is using text-based text messaging to do a lot of work in this space in healthcare to replace an on-site visit, even a telemedicine visit. And they're using a lot of AI algorithms, but then they're also utilizing and basing that upon clinicians managing each of those interactions with the patients, right? And so it's that merging of that in that clinical visit 
that is making that that organization successful right now. And I think that's one of many that we, we're seeing, and it's us organization tying it to the strategy so we can then drive this the right direction because that's where we're going to find the funding and, and the real strategic intent and implementation capabilities of these types of, of efforts. Can I, can I just add on top of that a little bit, Jason? Like the, the, I think what Chris is describing is um, applied AI, right? Like mm-hmm. actually using the AI to, to augment uh, clinical care at the point of care uh, is, is really where I think we're going to see the biggest impact in the healthcare industry at large. Uh, and there's just a lot of steps to get there. Um, so these kind of like early pilot projects and, and activities are really paving the way towards a, a just a, you know, a, a future with just better quality uh, and duration of, of our, <laughs> our collective lives. Agreed. Agreed. So if we transition to talk about AI just a little bit, hey, Seuss, um, how is Defense Health uniquely positioned to take advantage of AI technologies? Excellent question, because um, so the main reason why I came to the DOD, I used to be, you know, the first panel, you guys saw uh, Dr. Brenner, you know, talking, one of the panelists. I used to be at the National Library of Medicine nine years ago. I, I used to be a staff there doing research, different director at that point. Well, we were missing, uh, you know, my focus is healthcare, right? And analysis and informatics in healthcare. We were missing the longitudinal aspect because I could go to building 10 at NIH, get a nice data set collected for, for patients. But in the DOD, I can go and say the last five years, the last 10 years, the last 20 years of this service member, since an injury happened, what has happened to this service member over time? Or when they were healthy, I had data, all the way to when they got sick and after that. So the biggest uh, value of the MHS data, it is a longitudinal aspect that you will not find in any of the big uh, hospital network, right? Because you go to a hospital if you're sick, but in the DOD, people have to go to the hospital even if they're healthy. So the longitudinal component of the data, it is amazing. But we have to be very, very careful when we go and try to convince or sell things about machine learning or AI and so on. Why? First one, it is we need to keep what is the clinical relevance of what we are doing, right? Because it is something that we are trying to just, it is not, does it maintain the clinical perspective? Then it will not be adopted. It can be the best thing out there, but it will not be adopted. And the second one, being able to explain the output. And this one, actually, even I struggle sometimes because some of the tools that we develop and so on, they use neural networks and deep learning and BERT models for the natural language processing and so on. We put it out there, providers, providers come back to us and say, can you explain to me how it reached this conclusion? So being able to explain the output, it is critical. Otherwise, it will never be adopted. And then the last one, I would say it is more the data bias that we have. For example, in the DOD, you know, active duty, 80% plus, 85 maybe, are male service members, right? So that just adds bias to the data. Therefore, we always need to make sure that our models, when we build AI models, they don't drift over time, meaning they start performing an 80% accuracy predicting that somebody will develop PTSD or predicting that this person will recover from cancer and then suddenly start drifting without us noticing. So this is very important that anything that we do, we kind of monitor how it's performing over time. Yeah. Next question is kind of for the three of you again, because I'd like to see the individual uh, discussions. Where do you see the most potential for AI technologies within defense health? Ben, I'm going to start with you as a, as, as a Red Hat side. Uh, yeah, to the, um, I, would, I would say, uh, you know, I think the more obvious one and the one that's actually being done a lot right now is, potent, is uh, population health, right? Like so analyzing large data sets, looking for uh, insight for um, you know, various different cohorts and how you might, you know, apply 
uh, your energies to solving those problems for that, that cohort. Um, the real-time uh, predict predictive analysis uh, that uh, Dr. Kaban just talked about um, is, is really, uh, I would say, the next step of that, right? Like being able to, um, you know, understand that a, a patient is about to have an adverse condition uh, and, and actually get ahead of that um, and do it without, you know, uh, worrying about drift and um, the, uh, the bias that they, the data set may have. Um, I, I think that's an area we're going to start to really see um, improvement in healthcare. And then, then lastly, the thing that I gets me really excited is um, the potential for process automation and AI to really come together. Uh, and that's to, back to what Chris was talking about with, um, with the applied AI side of things, right? Where if you can actually um, model like a chronic kidney disease or any sort of care plan, right? And then have decision nodes within that care plan be influenced by an AI that is running off of large data sets. Um, I think that that's the space where we're going to start to see the most, the most potential and ultimately um, uh, better, better measured outcomes. I mean, just to Dr. Kapan's point about measuring those outcomes and making sense of them, with an automated um, care plan, you actually have set goals, right? So you can actually measure the outcomes against those goals. And that's a, that's a, a data point that's really necessary to uh, evaluate whether you're, you're being successful or not. Anyways, those are the three that I think are really out there and, and potent. Perfect, thanks, Ben. So, Chris, any uh, any additional things or, or comments on what Ben just mentioned about technology capabilities or or potential within within health? I, I think there are a lot of potentials, right? And I think we in the in the DoD are in a very good position in this space, not only from the direct care side but also the management of the business and the way we manage the business and the way that we send a large portion of our, our, our population out to the purchase care arena, right? And so I think when you meld those things together and then you remember what our real mission is, and it, it is a ready medical force, but a medically ready force, right? And that's important to really think about. So because then we step into more of the larger scale readiness aspect of things, and tying in with our partners in that side of the house, not just in within healthcare but together. And so part of that is, is going back to identifying the best use cases that we can drive this around, identifying where the data sits and, and then working to bring that data into the right platforms to do this work. Um, right now we're, you know, I'm in discussions around work in digital pathology in proteomics, genomics, medical data, medical, you know, uh, not medical, uh, obviously medical data, but, um, you know, medical device data and many other things. And so it's really looking at that spectrum and then how you're tying all that, those disparate sources together and then working the policy and process issues. Right now, we talked about it takes over 200 days for me to onboard a new data source. And it has nothing to do with the data. It has everything to do with processes and DUAs and DSAs from a sharing and usage perspective and us knocking down those types of boundaries and then working with the right communities to identify the priority tasks and, and, and not just in the clinical, direct clinical, but really that research realm as well, because that's where we're going to find our true insights that will then drive into the healthcare arena directly. And I think that's the big thing that's happened over the last 20 years is really the technology, but then also the exponential growth of data and tying all those things together. Agreed, and, and, and I love the points that you made. So, hey, Seuss, with this same question, but I'm gonna give a little bit different twist for you because you mentioned some of the things that I call syndromic surveillance, some of the things that used to be clinical decision support in the past. Has AI taken that to a new level with uh, treating our patients in the facilities? from an informatics and research standpoint? Yes and no, I explained. Why? Because um, unfortunately, this concept of machine learning, artificial intelligence, AI and so on, whatever you want to call it, it's a buzzword, right? Mm -hmm. so what has happened is it has enabled some tools from the 1980s 
to go and say, hey, I'm using AI, I'm using machine learning and so on, and all they're doing is just a simple linear regression. So the correct answer is yes. You know, now with all these models, like in the deep learning arena and so on, they are, you know, they scale, they look a lot of the, the heat, hidden variables. Yes, now we have better algorithms, better technology to get there and being able to satisfy those needs. Um, however, we have to be very clear, very specific about um, not overselling something because once we go start promising something that doesn't work, it will never be adopted. Got it, got it. Earlier on, we talked about some of the processes that need to be in place to prepare and, and manage data. What about infrastructure systems? Are there any that are required to take advantage of new AI, AI technologies? Chris, are you seeing any of that in EIDS? <coughs> I'm seeing, I wouldn't say too much of it. it it's, it's, it's the ongoing issue of, of what are those right things? And I think that's what we're, you know, as we move into a, a real compute and store capability with our new, you know, Go Cloud environment, I'm thinking more, I'm looking down the line two, three years and, and, and been brought up, um, you know, RPA and, you know, robotic processes, um, those types of things. I'm looking at how do we start to plan this the right way so we can then resource this the right way? Because I have people knocking at our door every day, but I need to think about it more from a holistic perspective and how I tie all these things together to serve like, Folks like Dr. Caban is one of my customers, right? And then how do we do this? And I, so I really see that kind of going back to all I was talking about those different disparate data sources. I really see this in a hub and spoke model. And that's kind of how we're developing and building out the, the, the MHS information platform is really the hub that all of these data sources are tied to. And the work is being done for, D, for DOD healthcare purposes within that MIP enclave. Over. That makes sense. It, it does make sense. Ben, from, from your aspect, are you, do you have a different viewpoint on infrastructure systems that may need to be in place to take advantage of AI technologies? Yeah, um, I'd say that, you know, the, there's a lot of technologies that are being embraced today that are enablers for AI. Uh, and um, I'd say the, the advent of technologies such as containerization uh, have really led to significantly smaller infrastructure footprints. And those smaller footprints are leading to distributed systems, uh, which will directly, uh, you know, impact and assist for compute storage and data in motion. So in um, those, and those systems are essential to producing AI at scale uh, and also producing re reproducibility, which is a big part of uh, success inside of AI, inside of data science. Um, I'd say that the IT industry has embraced the concept of microservices as well for simple data processing and functions and discrete logic. That same concept is now being applied to machine learning. So like researchers across NIH, HHS, DHA, and, and across the commercial market have been publishing algorithms as microservices and orchestrating the data flow between those services to produce predictive outcomes for some of our most like pressing uh, public health challenges, such as COVID-19, depression, diabetes, cancer, and, and uh, heart disease. So I, there's a lot of activity uh, for AI, but the fundamental infrastructure technologies have been embraced and are continually being embraced because they are the, the, um, they are the, the table stakes for getting to this sort of uh, AI ML space that, that we all want to be playing in. Great. So I got one last question uh, to kind of wrap things up for, for each of you to answer. Um, as DOD and the VA move towards an increasingly common electronic health record, it will obviously make VA data more available for defense health and vice versa. How do you think that a common EHR will help enhance your ability to conduct more advanced data analytics? Chris, I'm going to start with you. So I would say that's one of the reasons why on the DOD side, uh, my whole program office was moved out from under the J6 and over to DEMS for that whole purpose, to focus on that future state around data. Uh, data is a horizontal 
And it's and and that's kind of why I'm saying you know, we're looking at this more from a federal data hub perspective and in partnership with VA and other federal um, entities. And it's about really putting the right information, not data, the right information in the right hands at the right time to make it actionable for folks, right? And I think we have multiple different uh, projects with the VA already, and that's only going to expand. And, and that's all as we integrate more, more and more over time. Yeah, well, that kind of goes back to what you and I used to have here, right? information, knowledge, wisdom to outcomes, right? So absolutely. Ben, any thoughts on that and your ability to conduct more advanced data analytics with a common EHR? Uh, I would say uh, the faster we can get to a true longitudinal patient record, uh, the better, right? Like just having that patient record be uh, truly reflective of the patient's care over the li their lifetime is something that's going to be a big game changer because it, it, there's just a lot more rich content there to draw insights from. Great. Hey, Suze, wrap it up. Thoughts? Absolutely. So interesting enough, from the research point of view, we are not waiting for the EHR to come. We know that that's happening. So today, actually, for the last year, I have been having weekly meetings with three groups in the VA. We're developing already combined uh, joint machine learning models. The thing is the definition, right? For example, for the TBI mental health, we're doing that is to say what is the long-term effects of having a concussion? What is the long-term effect in the VA side? It took us about eight months to come up with the cohort. Why? Because the definition for TBI and mental health that VA uses is not the same one that the DOD uses. So it took us weekly meetings for eight months to determine and say, concur, right? So absolutely, there is a great opportunity to continue to work with the VA. And things are changing. You know, seven years ago, five years ago, it was not the same. Today, it is a great partnership with the VA that will continue to 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 enhance. Great. Gentlemen, uh, I can't thank you enough. Ben, it was great to get to know you much better over the over the, the preparations of this. Chris and Jesus, uh, it's definitely been an honor working with you in the past and continuing to work with you as we move towards providing the best services and longitudinal health record as possible for our service members, family members, beneficiaries, and retirees. So I want to thank you very much for all you do every day within Defense Health, with what you do every day, because it transitions to our industry and commercial health. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to now turn it over to our last agenda, our last uh, panel on the agenda today. It's the Chief Data Officer Spotlight. It's going to be moderated by my colleague, John Rom, as the Technical Director at Government CIO. John, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so, as uh, Jason said, my name is John Romps. I'm a technical director in our defense health uh, account at Government CIO, and I'm joined here today uh, by Carol Brismakowitz, the chief data officer of the Office of the Inspector General at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and also uh, joined by Ray Diot, uh, chief data officer, of global health care and life sciences with uh, NetApp. And as Jason said, our, our, this is the CDO spotlight. Uh, panel and just a, a short word of introduction like artificial intelligence isn't achievable without quality data behind it. And one of the things we're going to be getting into is one of those topics there. And as agencies move forward using data as a strategic asset and form a new federal chief data officer council, we're going to sit down with these uh, two panelists here to talk about best practices and some of the, the uh, interesting achievements they've, they've managed to uh, uh, come up with and accomplish working with their teams over time. So first, I'd like to jump in with uh, Carol. Uh, this question is targeted for you, and, and then Ray, obviously, if you want to join in and comment. Um, so we'd like to cover some of the ways that different parts of the government are leveraging the capabilities unique to AI and machine learning. So uh, could you discuss one of the recent cases in which your office is using data proactively to fight fraud, waste, and abuse? Thanks very much, John. So I appreciate this question too, because a lot of folks, you know, I'll always ask how many of you are happy to see your OID show up on your door if you're in the federal government, right? And who raises their hands? Like nobody ever, ever in the history of ever. Um, but one of the things that we've been really working on, I've been in this role for about five years, is truly empowering our OIG staff to use data proactively to help fight fraud, waste, and abuse. So the way I like to think about it is for the Department of Health and Human Services, there are a lot of providers doing exactly the right thing 
but there are some that are not. And so how do we leverage AI and predictive analytics to rapidly identify potentially those bad actors? Um, so we're staying focused even in this crazy time. I wanted to share with you an example of how we partnered successfully with our law enforcement agents um, to use predictive analytics to support their fraud detection efforts. And then it ultimately led to a case and a conviction. So I'm gonna tell you, right, sometimes these cases take a while to actually prosecute and come to conviction. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you some details. It was in a press release from October of this past year. So it's, real, it's pretty current. Um, of course, this is always a journey, but we found an opioid prescriber that had a high risk score in our predictive analytics. And he had some concerning statistics as compared to their peers. So, right, the volumes of data we're looking at with some of the Medicare claims data, it's a lot for a single person to look at. So we're trying to leverage AI and ML techniques to help us rapidly build these models and help us pinpoint where we need to focus on investigative effort. So in talking with our agents and showing them these high-risk models and the results, it actually led to opening a case. Um, so ultimately, the pill mill doctor was convicted on 16 counts of healthcare fraud and illegally dispensing drugs. So in part of this journey, right, we have to convey information to our partners, our agents, right, within our Office of Investigations, who also have to work with the Department of Justice to prosecute these cases, and ultimately that have to go in front of a judge and jury to explain what they're seeing in the data and everything else that they're finding in, in the case. So um, in this particular case, too, we actually had one of my staff was an expert witness at trial, a subject matter expert, to talk about what we found on the data and how it came to be and how it, you know, in some of the statistics, it looked like an outlier. But it's really a powerful way of rapidly going through the data to so sift through that data, specifically target potentially high-risk providers to focus our program integrity efforts. No, that's, that's very interesting. Um, but one follow-up, I guess, uh, you mentioned like one of your staff was an expert witness. Uh, was there anything special your team needed to do to prepare to, uh, I'm assuming like kind of like in the old days back when DNA was, was a relatively new um, way of, of introducing um, evidence that the new use of data and analytics might be a challenge for some juries or whatever, or, or, or judges to, to analyze. Were there, any, were there any particular challenges your team tried to anticipate and possibly address in that regard? I give my credit lots of team or lots of credit because they, they focus very much on how do I prepare to be able to address any questions that might come up. And I think part of the preparation is also, like you said, how do you prepare for a jury that may or may not understand data analytics, may or may not understand if you say outlier exactly what that means, right? How is yeah. that relevant, right? The term statistically significant matters to a subset of the population, but my mother would not necessarily understand that. So the way we try to frame it, right? It's like, if I were talking to my mother how would you explain kind of the math, the approach that got you to there? And how do you just serve as that expert witness, um, right? But the team's credentials are there. So it was just a matter of conveying that. So part of this is also about just the data storytelling and finding the right competency in your team and helping them be prepared to be able to tell that story about what they're seeing in the data. And of course, working very closely with the prosecuting attorney to make sure that we were part of the narrative and helping support the case. Oh, it's a really good point. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, Ray, any, any thoughts or follow-ups you wanted to toss there before I hit you with your question? Yeah, no, I love the, the comment about uh, data storytelling, right? There's always a facet of, of how do you articulate what you want to get across to the recipient or the consumer of the data. And that, that truly is an art, right? There's not a whole yeah. lot of science to it. It's very much artful. And it goes all the way back to a lot of the other comments that have been made across some of the other panelists today about believability of the data. Right, and, and the pedigree of the information. So I'm sure that, you know, Carol and her role has a tremendous amount of stock put into that believability, that faith, the trust, the, the integrity of information. And I think as a CDO, that's one of our, our critical uh, uh, roles that we have to fill in and that we have to provide to the rest of our organizations that we support. No, really good point. And actually, I think we'll circle back on that with the integrity of the data idea. That's something we want to pursue a little more. But um, before, I'd like to give you a chance to talk about one of your recent successes. Um, so I, we're all aware that data analysis and data science can be applied to many different topics. Uh, so for example, if you want to look at both healthcare and supply chain, we could discuss the distribution of personal protective equipment, I guess recently in the whole COVID thing, so otherwise known as PPE. Um, I think you have some knowledge of some recent projects related to tracking PPE that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, we actually, um, you know, I'm in Colorado, so we have, a, have had a little different curve than most have uh, when it comes to COVID. But one of the things that, that we saw come up uh, was the need for 
understanding what our COVID consumption was going to look like. And not just understand what it was going to look like, but how to plan around that. So we we had to take a, a look at not only our healthcare data to understand what was going on at the hospitals in the community, but also what the community and national models looked like, build models around that that we could predict off of and forecast off of, understand then blending together our PPE data and our inventory data into a forecasting model for it. But what we came to boil down was we pulled all of that information together, both in the modeling sense and in the data sense, uh, in order to build a what if tool so that we could provide planning and insights to our, our operators at the facilities and at the IDNs in the region so that they could better understand what happened if they did this. If they provided 10 million more N95 masks, you know, a week ahead of time or a week behind time, how much of a hole was that going to put us into or how far ahead of it, the, the curve did it get us? So we actually took data, you know, aggregation and, and data fusion beyond just getting to the forecasting piece of AI and the predictive piece of AI, but then built it into more of a, a reasoning system that allowed the augmentation of our operators to better plan and better understand the boundaries within which they can make decisions. And that's where we start drawing on the power of data is when we can start making really good decisions and understanding the risk around those decisions that we're making, as opposed to here's one number and one prediction that we're looking at. It gives us an envelope to play within and to better understand how to move forward as an organization when times are tight and there's a ton of uncertainty in the air. Now, that's fascinating. That's really interesting. The, 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 the number of things that we could touch upon, but one thing um, I wanted to, to ask about was, so you talked about providing insight to the operators, I guess, at the local level. And so your team had to build, I guess, a, probably a, some kind of user interface to help them. Were they, were they, the, were they the ones at the, at the user level, like actually going in and doing the what if analysis, putting in their own guesses to see what, what would happen and what the impact would be? And would that actually show impact beyond just their one location? It, it, it would. It, it would. So, so what we what we provided was we provided both a system view and a and a facility level view that you could adjust a slider. So we gave them a bunch of knobs and sliders to play with, so that it was simple, right? And they could say, oh, what happens if I do this? And our infection rate goes from five percent to fifteen percent. Or what happens if our shipment is delayed, you know, one day to twelve days? You know, they had the ability to play with all of those and to understand what that envelope of outcomes could look like. Wow. Uh, so this kind of goes a little bit towards, I guess, one of the earlier panels they were talking about the democratization of, of data science or of data analytics. And uh, I know there are tools out there like uh, I wrote e robot, uh, uh, rope, rope, uh, sorry. Um, the data robot. Uh, data robot. Thank you very much. Um, blanked out for a second there. I can picture the, the logo, but not the company name. Uh, but this sounds like your company took up, like you, you all took it a little step further with the knobs and sliders concept and that really democratized and gave them, I guess, removed some of the intimidation factor. And yeah, and I think, you know, when we talk about AI and data science and, and decision making, it's not just about having one tool in your toolbox. You know, if, if I'm going to build a house, I don't just take a hammer, right? I, yeah. I'm going to take all the tools. So, you know, and I'm sure that, that Carol's got the same perspective in OIG that, you know, you're going to walk in and you want, I want all of the predictive models, no matter how simple or complex they are. I want all of the, the forecasting models. I want all of the ability to play with data and visualize data. That way I can tell the story effectively yeah. and, like and understand story. exactly. Oh, great. Uh, uh, Carol, any, any thoughts on any of the topic, anything we just touched upon there before I, I, I kind of take us in a slightly different direction? I, I absolutely agree with Ray. Part of what this empowerment, the way we visualized it is how do we make it easy for our auditors, our evaluators, and our investigators to interact with data? So we've, we've kind of branded it, right? We talk about it as data at your fingertips, but I'm a believer in raise all boats. So right, like, there's a lot of folks in our organization that don't know how to program in certain languages and that's okay. I wouldn't want them to, but figuring out that interface where they can still interact and explore the data and get insights from it are incredibly important. So we've been on a journey as well to create an analytics hub that pulls together a lot of different tools that we have just to make it super easy for our agents to find what they need pretty quickly 
And we worked with them, put them in the driver's seat as kind of the product owner to help us design some of oh. that. So we baked in that customer feedback right away. We tend not to use the word customer. We very much talk about partner, right? How do we make sure, because they're going to be at the front lines using this data to drive, to drive insight and do something with it. So we wanted to make sure, how do we create an interface and an environment for them to get that data, to understand it, to interact with it, maybe where they don't have to have the data scientists with them, but then mm -hmm. they can use it and do something with it. And, and with that, we also designed just kind of, I call it the phone a friend team, right? Like my, my team is still on standby that if they ultimately have questions, they can still come back and ask, but we're trying to push out as much of that capability and tool set as we can, because now then you have more eyes looking at the data, which is also very powerful. Uh, one thing you mentioned there was um, use the term product owner. Um, and um, I know enough about Agile to be dangerous. Um, th does that in an indication that your team might be using some Agile or DevOps concepts for managing your models at all? Absolutely. So we embraced, so my partner uh, CIO and I, a couple years ago, actually four years ago now, totally embraced Agile as an approach for our teams and not just thinking about it from an IT perspective, but how do we, how do we just embrace that as a methodology and a framework? So we use it also within my team. Um, we did a consolidation last year of analytic functions into my team, and it was very much a core principle of how do we leverage Agile as an approach? How do we get our partners engaged with us as product owners to give us feedback? How do we think about things? How do we organize by sprints? How do we do retros? How do we figure out the backlog? Wow. The whole thing, we jumped in feet first into the deep end and just figured out how to make that work as we're developing all the things that we have kind of in our backlog, right? We have a queue of great ideas and we wanted to use Azure as the management approach to do that. So it's been really exciting for us. I know in the beginning, it was also the big change management journey of thinking differently <laughs> about how to do that and how to train our teams into Agile yeah. and how to make sure we're all using the same terms the same way. Um, but it's been incredibly powerful, I think, uh, for our team at least. Yeah, and I can imagine, Ray, that uh, with, with the work your team, you just described, with where I'm assuming your team had to turn that work around very quickly with the oh, yeah. for COVID and everything else. Um, were, there, were there any um, methodologies or approaches you all tried to apply for that? Uh, yeah, you know, I think any more working in this area, you have to subscribe to an Agile methodology. Uh, whether it's, you know, actually managed Agile or not is, mm -hmm. you know, kind of up to the, the user. Uh, but when you're trying to turn something in less than 96 hours that never was, you know, never existed before, it's kind of just get it done and then iterate, 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 iterate. And, and with that, right, we built backlog, we, we formalized everything, but getting product to the floor uh, in the time of crisis is, is, you know, just get it done and then yep. fix what you did wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Get it out there, um, assess it, iterate as you need to, to improve it. And yep. uh and communication, I mean, I assume is a Always. major uh, concern there. And um, just speaking of so communication within your team and also without teams now, based on what I've heard both of you talking about so far, it sounds like me, one of the things that makes everybody successful is, is sharing data, uh, not just within an agency, but across agencies. Uh, so um, I'll start with Carol here on this one. Um, do you think agencies have an obligation to share data whenever they can? Like not only with the inspector generals in the midst of an, an investigation necessarily, but so how does, along with that line though, how does your office decide whether it's safe and appropriate for your office to share data? Are there any standards or policies in place? Is it decided on a case-by-case -case basis? Um, if you could elaborate, please. So overall, my observation over the past several years, it's been exciting in the federal government because there was an, right, the open data initiative. Now there is a federal data strategy. There's kind of oh. a push about how do we better share data across the federal government and with state and local partners, right? There, there's kind of momentum there. Um, there is still a balance of how do you do that appropriately with authorities for that data to make sure that it's protected data, that security is there, the privacy, especially the data we're dealing with, right? Your personal health information. I think I remember seeing a statistic a few years ago about, right, that if somebody steals a credit card, it's worth, you know, like, I don't know, five cents on the market. If they steal your driver's license, it's worth maybe a dollar, but your personal health information record was like $20 or something, right? Like the street value of that record was just worth so much more. So we're really sensitive to ensuring the safety and protection of the information. But now granted, what we're trying to do is data mining. So you need access to more information and you're trying to integrate multiple sources because different departments and agencies have different views and can, can contribute to the overall picture. 
of what's happening potentially for, for a specific case. We are lucky as data stewards of a lot of this data, right? We, we, are, we are not necessarily creators of data as much as we are ingesting lots of sources of data. So we have things like the IG Act and the IG Empowerment Act to give us some of that authority. But there's still questions if we're trying to reach out to other agencies how do we navigate that authority? So for me, I have great partners in our council's office that help us understand that, interpret that. And then right, our chief information security officer is also one of the first people I turn to to make sure we understand how are we going to safely, securely transmit any data um, into our system if need be. Or what I also look for is like, can I get the express lane of can I just get access to the system that the department might have and how do we build uh, tools and capabilities around that, which I also see as streamlining and minimizing the burden on both sides of having to do data transfer or figure it out, just how can we be creative about kind of a master data use agreement, set the terms and conditions up front for sharing, and then appropriately um, move forward with sharing of data. So that that's kind sense. of my, that's my view on it. Ray? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I'm definitely a firm believer in um, privacy and security being first and foremost first and foremost, as we're putting together data strategy. Now, personally, my belief system is bifurcated because I believe that all data should be available for mankind to solve the hardest problems that we've got facing us today. The other half of me says, that's my data and you can't have it. So there's, there's a tension that, that I think we have to deal with both, I think, ethically and morally, as well as you know fiscally, because there's a fiscal potential, whether it's positive or negative, to having my data out in the community, right? And because I work so much with commercial and deal in life sciences and deal in healthcare, there's that potential that we have to deal with. And, and, and how can we balance, you know, exposure of uh, enough data to solve hard problems without exposing the, the privacy of an individual or a group of individuals? And there's always that tension in the CDO's office uh, between compliance and between regulatory and between security and privacy and the ability to get the job done. That is really one of the key art forms that, that I'm sure Carol would agree with that we have yeah. to balance as data providers and, and data curators for the larger organization. That's a really good point. And you no, know, I, I, for one, am glad that, that these people are struggling with the issue rather than just taking the, um, I'm just going to throw it all out there and let everybody play with it um, approach. Uh, but it is, you're right though, there is, everyone's got their mission they have to accomplish and try to, to um, complete. And that is a, must be a struggle. And, um, but I'm glad we have people like you, you all working on these things. Uh, one question did come in from the audience. I want to make sure we get to it before we uh, run out of time. And I think it's prim directed primarily at Ray, but it also uh, could fit with some of the things Carol was talking about earlier as well. So um, I'll direct it Ray first, and then Carol, you can chime in and before we wrap up. Uh, but so the question is this: uh, Can you talk about how you made it easy for your customers to search for and find relevant data, and thus the related analytics? Uh, that is a fantastic question, right? <laughs> Master data management, metadata management, data cataloging—all of those things are absolutely necessary in the age of AI. The problem is, is that uh, there's very few tools to help automate that task. So it's a very people first process. Um, I know at other organizations, people are starting to turn uh, their NLP and their AI on itself to do automated data tagging and to do, you know, some of those other, you know, mechanisms to help automate and recommend solutions to data stewards and data curators. But it is, it is absolutely a Herculean effort to do data cataloging, master data management, um, and, and metadata management, especially in the age of data lake here, data lake there, data warehouse over there, and the, and the, the fight between ETL and ELT when it comes to feeding large AI models um, and other analytics. So... What I would say in summary is just simply that the, is this, data cataloging and data governance is absolutely mandatory for any big data project here and for going forward. Getting to the answer of doing that work is a long and arduous journey. 
that typically takes a lot of ownership, both in the IT shop, in the data shop, and in the business units across the organization, because it's not just prescriptive uh, in terms of laying that information out. Uh, thank you. Uh, Carol, any thoughts? I would absolutely agree with that, right? Don't underestimate the, the human journey on this, right? For the governance pieces, we did the same thing. And I remember some of the original reactions were, well, why do we have to catalog everything, right? And it was, we kept talking about, well, we need to help OIG know what OIG knows, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we kind of embraced that adaptive governance model about there are going to be things that are truly our high value data assets. How do we get that kind of in a streamlined way? We don't okay. necessarily have to know everything. You can imagine in our organization, if we have an audit of a particular hospital, for example, not everybody would need to have that specific data set. Right. But some of the other things related to like the Medicare claims, kind of higher level data sets, that's the stuff that we wanted to make sure we were we were encouraging through the data governance process that we were talking about it. And then we were tagged, we did the same thing, right? How do you tag it appropriately? Mm -hmm. But even having the conversation, because the other thing for chief data officers is we're also driving a change management journey. So getting people to think differently about the data and what that mm -hmm. means and how we need to organize it and how it does mean what Ray was talking about. That's that partnership between IT, the CDO team, but also the business side and that everybody kind of understands the why we're doing this stuff, right? We don't create a data catalog just to create a data catalog. That's right. right. We create the data catalog to then help enable, right? Just like this use case to enable somebody to find the information they need very rapidly, which then is going to accelerate their work. But putting all that together, making sure everybody's on the same page, that's where governance comes into play. And usually if you come up people and say governance, they're going to shake their heads, roll their eyes, go the other direction. <laughs> so our approach had been to snowball that, right? How do, how do yeah. we get this focused on a particular project and then build our governance committee? Um, and that's kind of the way we approached it too. So it's yeah. not, it, we do have technology, but it's not just technology. It's definitely people. Always. That's a great point. Um, so uh, I, I'm really enjoying our conversation and I wish we can go longer, but we're just about out of time. Um, uh, Ray and Carol, thank you very much for your time. Was there anything else you wanted to kind of leave us with? Any parting shots? Uh, do you, Ray? No, I, I think if I had to close with, with one phrase, it would simply be that it all starts with the data and the data has right. got to be right. And the data has got to be consumable in order for us to drive decisions and drive advanced analytics and AI. Thank you. Uh, Carol, anything uh, you want us want to leave us with here? Oh, then your team um, is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would agree with that, but I would also say, right, AI is for all of us. AI mm -hmm. is not just, right, something for the data scientists or something for oh, those IT people. It's for everybody to understand. And so all the conversations that have come up throughout the entirety of today about um, understanding it, explainability, mm -hmm. bias, you know, it's not just for the data scientists to say, hey, here's my training data set. There's got to be people that can catch that comment and understand what that truly means. Great. So AI is truly here for all of us. But it's about we're all we're all doing this to help gain efficiency, to help see things that maybe we can't see as humans by ourselves to give us better insights. And it's about that. So what that we're on this journey for. So I think all of us, if you're not familiar with the lingo of AI, you have to be completely familiar with it and then figure out how to help all of your peers understand it, too, because it's going to impact all of us in a very positive way, I think. Great. Well, thank you both very much for your time. Um, really do appreciate it. And please uh, offer thanks to all the great people you're working with who are doing such good work for, for um, our country and, and everybody else. So thank you very much. I think that about wraps up everything for the day. Uh, and so I, I think uh, we can just say goodbye at this point. So thank you, Ray. Thank you, Carol. Thanks, Sean. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carol. All right. Well, thank you very much, John, and thank you to all of our speakers uh, this morning and afternoon. Uh, wonderful content and topics covered here uh, for our Artificial Intelligence New Horizons and Medicine event. Uh, we'll continue to follow this important topic uh, throughout. Make sure you follow our coverage for updates on these conversations on our website at governmentciomedia.com. And if you missed any of today's uh, virtual event, please check out, check out the uh, site. We'll have the full recorded uh, event on the site, along with all coverage, including articles, uh, as well as we're going to have a, a special podcast to go along with it as well. So please check that out. Finally, I'd like to thank again uh, our sponsors, uh, Axiom, NVIDIA, NetApp, Red Hat, and Data Robot for their partnership on this event. We're grateful for their continued support. So I'd also like to encourage you to sign up for our newsletter uh, and make sure you're um, subscribing to our podcast series. We have a great uh, list of um, speakers as well as uh, guests joining GovCast, CyberCast, 
uh, and HealthCast, as well as the Agile Advocate. So make sure you check that out on Apple iTunes or uh, Google Play or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, make sure that you everyone gets a chance to check out our next events. We have all of our events uh, set up for the rest of the year on our event page on our website. Uh, but I wanted to uh, highlight two. First off, our next one's going to be on cybersecurity. That's going to be on September 2nd. And then our the event following that, we're really excited for it as well. It's on September 16th. And we'll feature keynotes from the chairman and ranking members of the House Veterans Affairs Committee. So make sure not to miss that one uh, as well. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for joining us and uh, hope to see everybody soon.